Good morning and welcome to the Board of Supervisors meeting for June 28, 2011. Roberta, would you please call the roll? Supervisor Bennett? Here. Supervisor Zaragoza? Here. Supervisor Long? Here. Supervisor Foy? Here. Supervisor Parks? Here. Well, this morning's very special because our moment of inspiration is our Ventura County Sheriff's Search and Rescue Team. Uh, Ann Anderson, a team leader, Mike Grossman, the handler for K-9 Dino and K-9 Casey. The prior to uh, the late 1980s, the K-9 search and rescue in Ventura County consisted of a loose affiliation of a few handlers and trained dogs and were all volunteer members of a number of different county search and rescue units. In 1988, the handful of these handlers were strong support with strong support from the sheriff. Uh, uh, that was Sergeant Earl Matthews formed a separate canine unit known today as the Ventura <coughs> County Sheriff's Canine Search and Rescue. The unit trains at various locations throughout Ventura County once every week. Handlers also dedicate considerable efforts and their own funds to attend professional training workshops throughout California and the United States. All Ventura County K-19 members are volunteers, yet every handler is dedicated to providing a consistent and thoroughly professional response to the needs of Ventura County residents and outlining communities. And gentlemen, if you and your partners would like to come to the mic. Oh, I'm sorry, gentlemen and ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Superintendent, thank you for having us here. The board, thank you. We appreciate it. It's, uh, it's an honor to be in front of you guys and actually talking. We might get a little distracted with our dogs here, but uh, bear with us. A little bit of high energy. Um, my name is Mike Grossman. I'm the uh, public relations chairperson, or whatever you want to call me. I'm a handler, first and foremost. Uh, team Captain Ann Anderson. Uh, she's been with the team for 10 years. I've been with the team for three years, been on search and rescue for eight total. Um, with us today, Black Lab is canine Dino. Dino is trained in cadaver, human remains detection. Uh, canine Casey, canine Casey is a bloodhound and she is trained in uh, trailing for uh, lost children, Alzheimer's, uh, any kind of suspect. So mm -hmm. just man trailing. Uh, we've been in existence for since 88. Primarily, uh, we're an all-volunteer team, as you said. Uh, we train about a thousand hours per year, um, and as you can tell, they always want to work. <laughs> uh, really quick, how we pick our dogs. Most people don't know how we pick dogs. We pick the most crazy dogs that no one wants. Seriously, this is this is what we look for in a dog. This is a good working dog. The higher the drive, the better the dog. Except for Casey. Casey is like uh, she spends about 22 hours a day sleeping. <laughs> But that's okay. We only need her for two hours a day to search. So, um, you want to talk about anything? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, really quick, I have a full-time job. Anne is a lawyer first and foremost. Uh, she's a police officer with Santa Paula. I'm a reserve police officer with LAPD. Um, this is strictly volunteer, and I just wanted to put that out there because it does take a great. We we train five days a week. Um, so just so you guys know a little bit about the volunteer program in Ventura County. I can speak for all the teams. All of us are well dedicated uh, to, to Ventura County, to the Sheriff's Department, to the community. So it is an honor to come up here in front of you guys and, and talk freely with you. Just so you guys know, we are out there, and if you guys ever need anybody from our, from our units to assist you, we're always there. So, okay. Any questions we can answer for you? Or? Um, I know uh, we have one. Uh, Ms. Anderson, can, is it possible your dog could go on the other oh, side no, just so no, people can see? That way uh, it will be on the camera. Okay. Casey, she's 10 years old. She's just about to retire. And um, so I have a new bloodhound puppy that I'm in the works of. But it takes about a year to train them. So she's giving it her all the stay in there. But she's a good dog. We went to a number of cases all around the country. So she's a really good dog. So you do some traveling, huh? Yeah. I'm a contract employee with the FBI. There's like two bloodhound handlers in the country, and Casey's one of the dogs. So last night I was up until 4 in the morning working with the FBI. And then uh, traveled here with you guys at home. Uh, Supervisor, just I, I had the pleasure of, of um, the presentation at a Camarillo Rotary, so I got to hear more of the story, and that was one I wanted you to tell, um, and particularly that 
the, the bloodhound d- does amazing things and, and their abilities um, and, and how they're called to duty. And you don't, I had no idea they're so rare, but um, certainly when they're called to duty, they perform. Yeah. Um, one case in particular, the case that we did in Alaska, there was a we, we would need you at the mic. I just wanted the camera to be uh, able to There was one case that. in 2007 that we worked in Alaska. A nurse had, or a nurse practitioner had gone missing, and um, they didn't have any suspects because, her, well, they thought it was either her boyfriend or a contractor. Her boyfriend was the last person to see her, but, I don't know, he, was, he didn't report her missing, and he wasn't too concerned that she was missing. And then the last person to see her was a convicted rapist. So they thought, well, probably one of the two. But it turned out that um, all three, at that time we had three bloodhounds in the FBI program. And all three bloodhounds from different locations trailed to her next-door neighbor's house. And it turned out to be her next-door neighbor when they got a search warrant. He um, hid the jacket that he's wearing in one of the, uh, he had robbed her of ATM at, also. And they had, some, they had video footage of him. That jacket was sitting on the couch when they went in. He still had the ATM receipt in his pocket. And um, her watch was found in his room, along with a lot, a lot of other evidence. And then, um, since it was a death penalty case, they charged him federally because Alaska doesn't have a death penalty. So that was their first uh, federal death penalty case. And so he ended up plea bargaining out once they held up the dog evidence. So it was a really important case for us. One, one other thing, you're not um, affiliated with um, uh, Search and Rescue, the uh, Wilma's group. The no, we're not. Yeah. We're completely different. Everybody thinks that we are That's right. part of that group, but we're not. Um, like so, Mike said, we're an all-volunteer organization, and we raise all the funds yeah. by ourselves. Right. So that's, oh, that's my point. They, have, they raise funds for the dogs and for what they do, and they had a fundraiser, and, and just so anyone listening would like to help. Like yeah, because money. it takes a lot of money and time to train these dogs. We have to fly all over the country in order to obtain the proper training that we need to get them up to speed. <laughs> so we went to Texas to train the cadaver dogs because we don't have any water cadaver training in California. So we have to travel to different areas where they have that kind of training. So it takes a lot of money. So it's, it's specifically canine search and rescue. Right. There's, uh, there's seven or eight teams in Ventura County that are search and rescue. There's a dive team, there's three mountain teams, there's a medical team, and, um, and then the canine team. So there's different types of assets that are available to Ventura. And do the dogs live with you? They do. That's nice. Yep. Well, thank there you so dogs. much for volunteering. And if people want to help support, and I know it, it gets expensive getting them <laughs> trained, what is there a website or a number they can call? The, uh, the website is www.vc, as in Ventura County, S-A-R, for SAR, search and rescue, canine.org. So it's vcsark9.org. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you me. also for, Thank you. for doing this work. You saved lives. We appreciate it. Just really quick, um, I just want to point out one thing. Three years ago, when I came on the team, we only had one cadaver dog working for Ventura County Sheriff's. We now have four. And we ran a case that everyone's pretty familiar with, the Chelsea King murder down in San Diego. They called us out of nowhere. We didn't have any idea what was going on. And we ran the lead point on that entire case for the cadaver. Wow. So it is a, a testament to Ventura County and to the Sheriff's Department that our reputation is, uh, is out there. And I just want to drop back. I mean, Anne's kind of handled this whole thing. I want to kind of point it towards her because I'm sure running as a female is not as easy as running as a male in, in some of these organizations. But Anne's done a great job with the Sheriff's Department, K-19, and, uh, and she brought us to where we are. So I just want to point that out. You know, when Thank that, you. Uh, when, the, when, when, when that hound uh, retires, uh, there could be a good career in the Hounds of Baskerville and some of those other films. <laughs> that classic looking bloodhound. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, can I ask a question? Yes. I know they, they're police dogs, but do, do they have a ranking as a police uh, dog? You know, I know they're 10 year old. Uh, they have the same ranking that we do, it's just volunteer. So. <laughs> but no pain. No, no, no. no pain. <laughs> they mistake occasionally. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you for the next time. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, it's great to see volunteer, volunteers doing that and making such a big difference. Um, if we could all uh, do the Pledge of Allegiance. Supervisor Sarah Bosa, would you like to do this? Yes, I'll see you all in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible. 
Madam Chair, yes. uh, if, if I could, before we get into the other parts of the calendar, um, they called a uh, special session of the uh, Vicera Retirement Board uh, for today at 9 o'clock, which is a bit frustrating for me. Um, and so I'm going to walk over there and tell them that it's a bit frustrating for me to come <laughs> back. Um, so I uh, anticipate being back by about 9.30, but I wanted to let you know I'd be gone for that. and. Uh, Hopefully it won't cause any problems in terms of moving through the agenda. Well, that, that is very inconvenient to be a member on the board and have them do it right at the beginning of the Board of Supervisors meeting. So hopefully uh, they can plan it so that you can be there. Thank you. Thank you. Representing our board. Uh, the next item on our agenda is uh, minutes of the meeting of June 14th. I'll move the minutes. Motion from Supervisor Long, second from Supervisor Foy. If we could all please vote. He, he, he gets a pass. <laughs> our next item on the agenda is uh, our agenda review with our CEO. We've got uh, some suggested changes, I see. Thank you, Chair Parks. Yes. Uh, consent agenda item 21, there's a request to continue to July 12, 2011. On consent agenda item 26, there's a letter received from Nathan Boren. Time certain item uh, 33, six pages revised uh, within the 2010 Urban Water Management Plan, pages 4 through 10, 4 through 17, 5 4, 5 7, 9 1, and 9 3. And letters received from Teresa Jordan and Thank Carol Schoen, General Manager, Zone Mutual Water Company. What was that last one? I'm sorry. You said uh, consent 12 was moved to July 12. Item 21, the consent agenda was moved to July 12. And that's regarding purchase order contracts right. with the health care agency. That's Thank item 21. You. And then he mentioned item 26. several changes then. To, you, were, you were stating on the water one? On item 26, there was a letter, and then on item 33, uh, there's a revised letter. Okay, and that's the water, sh water management That's plan. right, urban water management plan. Mm -hmm. And additionally, you have some more? Yes, uh, yes, the hits just keep on coming. <laughs> uh, time certain agenda, item 34, received a letter from Linda Reynolds. Uh, time certain agenda items 35 and 36. There's a request to continue the item till July 19th, 2011 at 1.30. Uh, that's upon mutual agreement by both waste management and the county. Uh, on item 36, we also received a letter from Nathan Bourne. And then lastly, regular agenda item 37. Uh, there's a revised board letter and resolution to remove the crisis team clinician, senior crisis team clinician, and crisis team clinician, uh, PDP, and senior crisis team clinician uh, from the letter. And there's been a revised board letter filed. Okay, thank you. And that's it. And I, I do know that sometimes we get emails at 3 and 4 in the morning and, and try to make sure that we recognize them in time for our 8.30 Board of Supervisors meeting, just in case that individual is still up and uh, watching, they know that we did get it. But it's always preferable to get it sooner. <laughs> Still uh, we now, uh, if we can have a motion then to accept the agenda as um, modified. Mm, and again, motion by Supervisor Foy, second by Supervisor Long. If we could all please vote. <coughs> Bless you. Bless you. <laughs> and that motion passes for zero. And our next item on the agenda, then, is our consent agenda items, items 10 through 29. If we have any uh, ones that you'd like to call out, board members, otherwise uh, we will entertain a motion for those items. Ma Madam Chair, I just, uh, I just want to thank uh, Dave Flesh on uh, uh, 26. You know, 26, you know, they uh, were submitting grants for, uh, for some uh, safe route uh, grants over in El Rio and... And I just want to thank you, Dave, for doing that. Hopefully we can get that, that money. One of the things that I'm looking at, too, and I know it's, a, it's private uh, property, is the Wright Road. You know, it's, uh, if you've been over in a real Wright Road, it's, uh, it's about three blocks of absolutely dirt, you know, and 
and it's uh, when it rains it's muddy and it's just horrible so hopefully maybe Dave and Jeff Pratt or can help you know just give us an estimate on how much it'll cost to take care of it maybe get some private funding or some volunteers or something that will help those kids out there in El Rio and I'm also working with Assemblyman Das Williams on that too mm -hmm. maybe try to and get this some. is a private road it's a private yes. road uh -huh, and because I know uh, there's also one in Somas that I will be inheriting <laughs> shortly which is a dirt road right behind the post office that everybody's using so we do have some places like that in the county that yeah. have a lot of public traffic on them and are in poor state and this one particular alley is about three blocks and it and it's right directly into the school, and the kids use it. And it's, in the wintertime, it's just uh, it's just horrible. So, but I want to thank uh, Dave and you know for for working on this uh, safe to school project and, and and Mr. Pratt's office. You know, I think we have to be careful of those because there's, as Butch Britt had said, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles of private alleys that once you do one, you start doing everybody else. So we have to be very... And this particular one, I wouldn't, you know, if it was uh, not going directly into the school, it probably would not be as as, uh, as important, but the, it's directly right into the school, and the kids go right in the morning, and they walk right to, especially in the, in the uh, wintertime when it's about a six inches of water and mud and so forth, and... It's but, good to look for some creative funding yeah. for those type of projects. I agree with you. But I want to thank uh, Dave and, and uh, Mr. Pratt for applying for those grants. Thank you. Uh, and so we had our motion and second on the consent items 10 through 29. Mm -hmm. No second yet. Yeah, well, okay. I Supervisor second. Zaragoza seconded. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we could all please vote. And that also passes uh, with all on board here. The next item on the agenda is our public comments. Do we have any public comment cards? Okay, I don't see any public comment cards. So we'll go to the next item on our agenda. If, if uh, uh, that would be our, our board comments. And so... Uh, I think what we can do is go ahead and do our board comments and then also um, leave them open so uh, Supervisor Bennett can have an opportunity to comment too when he gets back. Uh, so let's begin with uh, Supervisor Foy. Thank you. I'd like to adjourn a memory of the people on this list. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, as I was saying to Supervisor Long here, it's, we're looking at the budget, all of a sudden we see here yesterday that our governor in the last 10 days came up with $4 billion, so we've got some magic going on. Um, the thing that was really interesting to me, though, but if the, he put a trigger in there, if the $4 billion doesn't show up, it said, I think, in the $1 billion, if it's only $3 billion, then we'll just move it on and kick the can down the road to the next year. But if it's $2 billion, oh, we'll make cuts of only $500 million. And if it's $3 billion, I think we'll make cuts of a, only a billion. So um, I, I just wish that... We, he would stick to what he said in his word in regards to no gimmicks, because I think that uh, I think the public was asking for that, the no gimmicks, and and we should do that. It's um, the idea that four billion dollars will come out of nowhere is is uh, a lot of wishful thinking. As I heard a very uh, uh, interesting person on the uh, columnist on the radio from San Francisco had said the same thing. It was. I don't know where this magic comes from in 10 days, but I think we just need to be real straight so everybody understands, especially our own agencies here, know what they have to do and, and how to deal with it up front. So my comments. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Long? No, I'm waiting on someone to show up. Can I pass for a minute? Thank you. Okay. And Supervisor Zaragoza? Yes, I have one item that I'd like to report, but also I'd like to adjourn the memory of the folks on this list. On uh, Saturday, I... Um, the Oxford Police Department has a really excellent program for uh, students that want to learn mechanics and work on cars and so forth. And the uh, Oxford PD has a uh, car, and I just call it a drag racing uh, racing car. And it's really really nice car that they fixed up, and they and they have the uh, the teenagers and the youth work on it. They also have a. a um, project that works with the private industry and the high schools where they teach the kids mechanics and, and also how to fix their cars and so forth. And there's about eight kids that really got uh, some really great scholarships. 
Eight of them got a thousand dollars each to continue on to a tech school, you know, for mechanics. And then one individual that never missed a day of school and learned how to do everything that was supposed to be done in mechanics got a two thousand dollar scholarship to continue on the mechanical uh, uh, school studies and work. And it was just great. Those the cars that they put together are just unbelievable. The uh, biggest thing there too is that this uh, youth also have the opportunity to become police explorers so they get him off the street and one individual is going the wrong way he was wanted to become a gang member and all of a sudden he got into the program and now he just turned uh, completely around to an excellent student and he's the one that got the two thousand know, dollars so it was great a great program so i just wanted to share that with the public i think that's a that's tremendous uh, to see i think sometimes in the school system, it's you know it's moved to 100% academics, and you know a lot of the kids don't do 100% well in academics. If we could do more things, they could work with their hands, they could learn these trades. I remember a car one time I had and brought it in to get it fixed. I need a transmission, and I said, oh, "You're going to fix?" It? He goes, "No, we don't. We just put new ones in." I said, "Why don't you fix them? We we can't find these kind of mechanics. You know our schools don't produce these kind of kids anymore, and that kind of stuff. And it would be great for these kids." And that's, have that a, opportunity. that's a good point because one of the uh, mechanics over at Rio Mesa, well, the instructor, was talking to the individual and he says, I'm not going to go to college, so, but I want to learn a trade. And, and he's the one who got the, the $2,000. Yeah, you're right. I, uh, one of my clients had a down in the oil industry, the same thing, where they said, I wish they produced more welders. You know, our welders down in the oil, in the refineries make $150,000 a year, but we just don't produce them. I mean, those are good paying jobs. Yeah. That's an excellent program. Thank you. I know we always have trouble trying to find helicopter engineers for our, our two helicopters that are out there. Um, I would like to just uh, first uh, ask that we close in honor of the people on this list, of which I would like to call out two individuals. Uh, one is Donna Lee Cohey, who was a, a, a nurse for uh, 51 years and ended up... Uh, retiring from uh, Los Robles Hospital, but also worked at Calu um, as an instructor there and also uh, was a wonderful uh, volunteer in our community, including coaching AYSO soccer for 11 years, volunteering their church and elementary schools. And also Robert Thomas, uh, who was a, uh, a veteran of the Korean War but also was a taught mathematics and um, coached football at Thousand Oaks and Newberry High Schools. He said, co actually coached football and golf for 35 years, positively influencing the lives of nearly 10,000 students. You just really realize how much a difference a teacher can make. I also just comment on a, a couple of things in my district. Uh, one was a, I was able to attend the 50th uh, anniversary of the Conejo Valley Masonic Lodge. And boy, does time fly. Uh, the, it was, it was a, a pleasure to be able to participate in the ceremony. Um, also wanted to note, since later on our, on our agenda, we are having our housing element, uh, that uh, many mansions just recently found out that they are the recipient of some federal tax credits available to them uh, for $11.4 million in federal tax credits, which will be enough to uh, gap all the other, with all the other funding, gap the one hole that they had left. And you realize any of these kind of projects, how much work it takes to cobble together all these funds. They had funding from the City of Thousand Oaks Redevelopment Agency, which is a big assist, as well as from the State California and Housing Community Development Division, the County of Ventura, the County Behavioral Health Department, uh, the Ventura County Continuum of Care, the Federal Home Loan Bank, the Mississippi Valley Life Insurance Company, the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development, the California Housing Finance Agency, the U.S. Bank, uh, which will be able to use those um, tax credits. Uh, the project is 60 units. It's on a, uh, a, a, it doesn't say what size the lot is, but I'm thinking it's roughly five acres. Um, it's on Hillcrest. But the project's going to include five residential buildings, a community building, picnic areas, a community garden, and a playground. And it's going to be designed with green features uh, and will be certified green communities. The complex will be a mixture of one, two, and three bedroom units. All units are restricted to low-income households. 
half to extremely low-income households who are currently homeless. So when you, get the, when you go to extremely low-income and homeless, that is making a huge difference. And uh, that will be able to meet the needs, as we're seeing, with the, uh, the homelessness that w of the recent homeless count that we found. They also provide a lot of on-site programs, including um, after-school tutoring programs, summer camps uh, for the children, case management, job development, and other programs for formerly homeless adults and families. And it just it, it stands out to me because for so few acres, you get 60 homes uh, for people that uh, are almost homeless or are homeless. So I, I, that's pretty outstanding to see that it come. Uh, with that, that concludes my board comments. And so uh, we can go forward now oh, with. I'm ready now. Oh, okay, I'm ready now. good, uh, Supervisor Long. Go thank ahead. you. <laughs> All right. Um, first, I'd like to submit this list to adjourn in memory. And um, thinking about July 4th holiday coming up, uh, I want to call out a couple folks on here. Um, Mary E. Wilson. Uh, Mary was part of the 99s, which is a women's flying club, and served as its president. And it was formed, um, and it's been around for decades, back during World War II, and it was for women pilots and aviators. And um, has, has been a very strong representation of their uh, contribution to our country. Um, also for Jean, uh, Mary Wilson was from Camarillo, Jean Catherine Dunn Hillerby from Oxnard, one of the first 50 women's Army Auxiliary Corps members. Um, so again, a long time uh, dedication to our country. And also for um, Albert Matthew Zanella of Camarillo, U.S. Navy and U.S. Air Force veteran, Ventura County General Hospital Food Service Director. That's how far that goes back, General Hospital. So, uh, again, in memory of those folks from the district who will be, will be missed. Um, as to the governor's I, pronouncement, I haven't, I haven't heard any real details. I think there's probably been a blip in some of the um, uh, revenues coming into the state, not nearly enough, and certainly agree with you that they should be handled responsibly and not, not given to um, ongoing cost um, uh, and, and not just um, kicking the can down the road. But we'll see what that can looks like probably when the details come out. <laughs> um, I had the uh, opportunity to cut a ribbon for the... Um, Second, ox second, uh, second tattoo removal clinic um, that has been put together um, in, here in the county. Actually, there is one that was started in West Ventura years ago, um, and it came over from a uh, nonprofit uh, program, and, and we're trying to re-jumpstart that one. But the one in Santa Paula was started 12 years ago. Um, and it's been so highly successful in that there have been over 5,000 treatments provided and just 11,000 hours of community service, and people's lives really have been changed by that tattoo removal program. So that was, were, that was Saturday, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Saturday, because I had one of my staff members, I think. But yes, good, good yes Stan was there. Yeah. Stan Hicks was there. So a good, good program. Mm -hmm. we, um, we worked with, uh, at, at the time that Las Lislas opened, um, uh, the second, the new site of Las Islas, uh, talked to Dr. Cervantes, and he and he was very excited, as was his team, in saying, "Let's put one here, um, where we want, we know it can be um, very useful and needed." And so we worked because it does take. Um, uh, we had to go after some uh, grant funds, and and able through Oxnard, with our partnership with Oxnard through Operation PeaceWorks, to get the sixty thousand dollars for the for the machine itself. And the rest of the services provided by the volunteers, by Dr. Finger, um, uh, uh, um, and, and a whole team of volunteers. Just it really is run both in Santa Paula and now at Las Islas by volunteers. And Mike Matlock was very instrumental in helping us get those funds. So it um, opened its doors on Saturday at 8:30, and there were they had 32 people go through uh, in the morning, and they go through, they get registered, they go through orientation, they understand what their commitment is for community service. Um, they were waiting in line to come through the door, so it really does speak to what um, what is needed and, and the success of putting something like that together, and, and great volunteers, and also Dr. Delgadillo was there too, and uh, so it was it was good, it was all good. Probation was represented. Um, the other thing I just mentioned, we, um, I, I uh, took the opportunity along with um, 
Port Wainimi Council Member John Sharkey and traveled up to Sacramento last week to meet uh, to speak in front of the CARB board, the full CARB board, where they heard and acted unanimously on the um, uh, clean fuel shipping zone issue uh, with the Santa Barbara Channel and the fact that uh, CARB and its mission to um, improve the air quality along our coastal counties, which is important to do, uh, back in 2009 crafted a rule that in essence pushed the um, uh, shipping vessels out of the channel and out around the channel islands to the outer edge, pushing them right into the missile test range for Naval Base Ventura County. Not good. Um, there could have been target practice, but it wouldn't have played well in the paper. So they, did, they, they didn't do that. They had to, and the Navy reported, um, they had to do some significant uh, couple of times changes in their operations in order to avoid the vessels, even though Everyone did their best to notify the vessels of you're going into this test range and et cetera. So we worked with the CARB staff along with um, the, the vessel, uh, international vessel organization and um, uh, environmental groups, the Clean Air Coalition and the uh, um, um, American Lung Association, interested stakeholders to look at how we could change the rule, amend the rule, so that um, we could incentivize the shippers to stay in the channel and obviously get them out of the test range. And that's what was before the CARB board. They approved it unanimously. It really was excellent work by lots of people. Um, and it, um, and it uh, will certainly serve, uh, serve in our, our goal to keep Naval Base Ventura County strong and its mission strong. And, um, not have any uh, open range target practice out there. Mr. Supervisor, are they going to be continue to use the channel or what are they? This will direct them back into the into channel, the channel. Um, because they will have uh, um, the, the incentive to, uh, what, it, what it did is ex it expanded, ex it expanded the zone of, of okay. where they are to travel for the clean fuel. So it went 24 um, uh, kilometer miles outside of the uh, Channel Islands as okay. the outer limit, not the coastline, so expanded that footprint. So that helped tremendously. Yes, yes it did. Um, <laughs> and it also gave them an incentive to come through what they call a, a window notch up by Santa Barbara if they, in fact, have clean fuel. And the interesting part of this is since then, since 2009, is um, many of the operators have already converted to the clean fuel. Um, they're having some challenges with some viscosity issues and things that's well beyond my, you know, understanding of the chemical composition of the fuels that are being used and what they're needing to do to change that. But they are, the industry is actually moving to do that. But that's very important because the, uh, the Navy was concerned about the encroachment is issues. And we're talking... Uh, well, uh, encroaching on the sea test range the was a big issue. Range, well, it yes. was a very big issue. So, um, yeah. and, there, um, and I'll say there was also a commitment made by the CARB staff uh, via the CARB board direction. And Mary Nichols does a, she's really a tough chairperson. Um, to take the next look now at the issue related to the speed of the, of the vessels in the channel and uh, issues with um, impacts and, uh, uh, on whales and, and other issues related to um, speed of vessels. But noting right away uh, the unintended consequences of this first rule in 2009 may have the same issues for us in slowing vessels down um, uh, and pushing them outside of that channel because they... Uh, their intent is to get, um, obviously, their products delivered faster to the ports uh, okay. and not to be slowed down in their um, bottom line. But L.A. and Long Beach have already moved to give an incentive to those vessels who slow down um, a, a reduction in their berthing fees. So there's ways to do that, to get the cooperation and to make sure it works well both for commerce but also for the industry and the and that's um, an, environment. an actual freeway of ships out there in the channel. It absolutely is. Well, yeah, there are also, so. as, as you're talking about slowing the ships down, because they were finding that they were hitting whales, among other. And I'm wondering what nexus does CARB have in trying to deal with that issue? Well, actually, the staff have that same question. So they're just starting to do kind of the, the conversation with other um, organizations or, or who may have a stronger nexus both within the federal government and otherwise um, and, and the science of whether or not there this the whale collision is occurring um, more frequently because of XYZ has not been completed yet so but I guess it's a, a potential unintended consequence of moving the ships farther out that they may be hitting more 
boils. But, you know, I, I, the key thing that RDP 20 is working on is saving those uh, 18,000 jobs and $1.6 billion payroll there that, that's really extremely important to us by, yeah, by reducing the encroachment uh, issues. And also, of course, you know, the, uh, the smog is coming into it. Uh, Sure. Well, the clean air has already, again, there's already been such a reduction because of the conversion to clean fuel that there already the impact yeah. uh, value to the clean air has been already remarkable. It's amazing how much of Ventura County's air pollution was coming from those ships. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Right. It's either the ships or L.A. we get squeezed in between. Yeah. It comes over the hill. Even more so than just car traffic. <laughs> um, last thing I would comment on, it's certainly been covered well in the, in the papers, is the um, hearing that was held by the um, uh, Statewide Commission on Redistricting. And I just wanted to say that Supervisor Zaragoza and I both signed a letter that was submitted to the record that talked about um, uh, the support for the, the proposal that was put together by a good coalition of people in Oxnard and Cause and others that said we needed a united Oxnard and, and, instead, and, and not just um, saying don't do this to us but a proposal that said if you do it this way there will be these impacts in these other communities but they're minor compared to breaking up Oxnard and, and I thought that was a good direction to go in um, and, and we'll see what the commission does with it um, and it was uh, well worth the effort to and th this was really just focused on the assembly not just but focused on the assembly and the senate seats not on the congressional ones so and, and uh, I, I also sent a letter uh, in support of the cause proposal to not break up the city of Thousand Oaks right. and keep right. both Oxnard and Thousand Oaks from being right. split apart right mention that too Okay. And the mayor of Sanford was in agreement with us, too. Yeah, we could have almost brought that to the board as a full board letter, That's but right. I believe the comment period ends today. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and lastly, speaking about July 4th and a time that we want everyone to stay home and vacation and, leave and, and keep all your discretionary funds home, having fun in town, in our harbors, and in our, our specifically Channel Islands Harbor, and all the other good things that happen in our community for the July 4th. There was a um, reception that was kicking off the Green Expo Boat Show at Ventura County Channel Islands Harbor. And uh, it was an uh, opportunity to, to both recognize the work that's been underway in our harbor to, uh, and, and the steps, the quiet but steady steps that are taken to um, uh, have practices in the harbor that are green practices. And we have a history of doing that. And, and um, in, in that uh, recognition for that, uh, we received a certificate of recognition from the um, coalition of folks who put this boat show, Green Expo, on. And it uh, is, is, was presented at that time. Uh, my staff assistant was there, and, and our CEO was there. And perhaps Mike can speak to it too, to this um, VIP reception. I wasn't able to go. Uh, oh, but it was in recognition for outstanding environmental achievement in harbor management. And when this was brought to my office, I looked at it and I said, well, this is, this is certainly recognizing the board's leadership, but it really does go to the folks who do the work day to day to day to day, and that's our Ventura County Harbor director and her small but mighty team, Lynn Krieger. If you'd step down, I'd like to bring this down and give it to you for and your good work in our harbor. And we had the tall ships there, too. Oh, that's right. Yeah, well, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Talk about the weekend <coughs> activity. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Chair Parks, uh, thank you, Supervisor Long. I did have the privilege of uh, attending this reception, and uh, it was a lot of good recognition for the green practices, but there was more to it than that. Uh, I got to meet some of the lessees. Uh, I'll call them the investors uh, in the harbor, and what a remarkable group. I've heard about them, but to meet them in person and to hear their passion and commitment uh, to investing in the harbor because they care about it was pretty remarkable. And so that was a great uh, thrill. I thought they were on Lynn's payroll or something. So it's amazing how dedicated they were. But it spoke to two things. One, and that is uh, their praise for Lynn uh, and her team. They really have a lot of trust uh, in her, and they just said in other harbors up and down the country, there isn't this kind of relationship. So they couldn't say enough great things about Lynn and her team and about the board. Uh, the, the board of supervisors. A big part of this reception was to honor the board for their commitment. And it, to a person, they said, your support means so much to them when they're investing, investing and taking risks to make the harbor better. So it was a great event. Uh, thank you. you and your team do the work. I know this is a surprise. I appreciate you coming yeah, in no, for no, it, but do. you need to hang this in your office. We'll hang it. Well, actually, we'll hang it up by the patrol where everybody yes. can enjoy it. Yes. Because everybody works hard toward this. And we 
we really have tried to work hard, as you all know, to be leaders in the green operation of marinas and harbor fronts, and you all have been very supportive of allowing us to redo how we do our parks, you know, redo how we run our boat engines. I mean, it all, I was listening about the carbon emissions. I mean, we started in 2001 okay. replacing our engines with greener engines and um, tried to get ahead of the game, so I really appreciate it. And the whole it. thing with the, with the boats and the clean, uh, how they don't dump in the water. Right. We were very early on that, too. Yeah, we, we try to be the experimenters. Right. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but it works more often than not. But that should be... Thank you very much. So thank you. Thank you to all of you for your support. Amen. Appreciate it. Madam Chair, I also would like to thank uh, Lynn you know, for the work on the BISC, you know, on the, on the launching ramp, the new, we're going to get hopefully a new one, and, and the painting of the buildings over Fisherman's Wharf, and, and some of the good things that are happening there at, at the harbor. You know, and, and you continue to work with the lessees, and also the residents there in the surrounding community. So. I think it's important that we continue it, and thank you for your good work. Yeah, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's recognized. Our next uh, item then on our agenda, we'll, we'll hold a one board comment open until Supervisor Bennett returns and go to our regular agenda item number 37, and this is regarding... Uh, or establishing seven classifications, and this also, as noted, had a revised board letter. Chair Parks, members of the board, Mr. Powers, Kelly Shirk, CEO's office. Today we um, have bringing another classification board letter to you, as we do uh, throughout the year, to help us manage our classification system. We have uh, three classifications that we'd like to establish today, five that we'd like to change the titles on, and eight that we'd like to delete from, that are not being utilized at this time. Additionally, we'd like to check, place the um, Chief Deputy Assessor classification in the unclassified service. And today I have Rick Jackson and Dan Goodwin here to answer any questions you might have related to their specific classifications. Are there any questions from the board regarding this? All pretty well spelled out in the board letter. Yes, ma'am. Then do we have a motion? Let's move the recommended action. And a second? And if we could all please vote. Thank you. And that does pass on a 4 0 vote. The next item on our agenda is agenda item number 38. And uh, Mr. Berg is here on the living wage rate. And good morning, uh, Chair Park, Supervisors, Mr. Powers, uh, for the recommendation of Jeff Berg with CEO's office. The item before you today is to receive notification for a 50 cent increase in the living wage rate and adopt a resolution amending the salary range for the county worker classification. This action will move the base wage rate for the living wage up from $9.50 an hour plus $2 in benefits to $10 an hour plus $2 in benefits or $11.50. $11.50 an hour without benefits to $12 an hour without benefits. At this time, I'll have, answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Are there any questions from the board? Okay, and I note that um, the item stated that this is mandatory. Correct. And that there's an ordinance in place. Correct. That uh, if the county CEO doesn't find that it would be a burden to the budget, that it is an automatic, basically automatic with the board approval adjustment. Correct, yes. I'm going to second. Go ahead. Go. Go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to second this. I think it. Uh, um, we had lots of discussion when this ordinance was adopted, the pros, the cons, the, um, the, the, the strength of doing so and leading by example, and I think that it has served us well. Um, our contractors are, are, um, uh, perform well and, and understand it and, and comply, and, and I think it serves us well. We, and, I, and I'll just say quickly, some of our discussion was you, you, either, you either help support the workers at the front end or they certainly end up in our system at the back end. And, and it really was a um, representation of, uh, of respecting the, the dollars that are taxpayer dollars that are used uh, for services rendered and making sure that the um, workers uh, who participate um, are respected with that living wage. So. They say uh, the, the, the dominant group that receives the benefit from this are security services. 
And we have a motion from Supervisor Zaragoza, second from Supervisor Long. If you could please vote. I'm not going to be able to support this. I think this causes more unemployment, higher project costs, and everything else. And the motion passes on a 3 1 vote. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is item number 39, and this is uh, adjustments, year end adjustments to the budget. Good morning, board members. Paul Dursey from the County Executive Office. As your board is well aware, we adopted uh, next year's budget. Now we're back to your board today with our annual final, uh, we'll call budget cleanup board letter for the current fiscal year. Um, have just a few, uh, most of them are relatively routine, just kind of like to highlight a couple items. About 145, excuse me, 145,000 of adjustments to contingency in this board letter. Uh, one is animal reg and the other is indigent legal services. The other two uh, somewhat significant items are the reduction in the designation for attrition mitigation due to the sheriff's need for $910,000 of additional appropriations for their shortage. And then the uh, tobacco settlement health care designation, about $869,000 reduction in the uh, designation for health care. So those two designation decreases are significant. The other thing is the loans. At the end of the, at the, end of the uh, board letter, we asked for your board to approve the uh, rollover of loan balances. We are asking for an up to a $2 million amount for VCMC. However, I think it does of note that uh, we probably need to uh, notify or recognize VCMC for their accomplishment in paying off their current outstanding loan. It was at one time in excess of $30 million. It's down to zero now that they paid off, they paid off the general fund, those dollars, and they're in uh, relatively uh, good cash position. I'll say cash position because they are in decent cash position, especially relative to where they were uh, just two years ago. This is, um, they have done quite a good job uh, in that amount. Uh, we don't know. We're asking for that amount just in case, but we hope they don't need it. But we, just in case they do, they may need it for a, a payroll, which actually is uh, we have a third payroll in the month of June, so they may, may need those dollars. So Paul, that, that's just for cash flow? Is that what it is? Yes. That's just, cash flow. Just to keep them going? Yes. Okay. Uh, other than that, well, we have one other additional item, if you don't mind, Board. Uh, the auditor controller requested that we do something. We don't normally uh, add... Uh, adjustments for revenue at, at the end of the year. We just pretty much kind of let it fall through the balance to the fund balance. But there was a reimbursement from the state for uh, 2010 elections. So the auditor controller requested that we go ahead and appropriate it to the contingency amount. It's a million two hundred thirty-four thousand one hundred thirty-seven. From their standpoint, they'd like to account for it in a particular way. So we said we'd, we'd present that also at your board. It is not in the board letter. It was kind of added at the end. At, right now, actually, it's being added. Uh, but uh, pass the check quick. Yes, exactly, exactly. So it's about a million, a uh, little over a million two, uh, and it's from 2010. So we said, okay, we'll make this. We'll, we'd be more than happy to present that to your board to go ahead and appropriate that to contingency in the current year. It eventually will fall through the, the fund balance from the, from the general fund standpoint, but from an accounting standpoint, the auditor controller requests that we include that. Was that a surprise that we were just getting this now? Well, well, when did you well get it? it's always a surprise when they actually do repay us. Let's yes, put it that way. Say. Uh, a timing, we knew about it a couple of weeks ago. We were just generally going to let it kind of fall through like we normally do. Mm -hmm. But uh, the audit control asked us uh, to go ahead and include it, and we, and we are willing right. to do that. Um, three questions. One is, did that uh, totally reimburse us for those elections in 2010? I believe it did. I'd have to double check with... Uh, I believe so. We can double check on that. I think it did, though. They generally, on those types of things, if they're, if they're calling it, it was a special election. So generally, if there's a special election, they will fully re reimburse us. And otherwise, uh, that, the funding for that was paid out of our general fund. Yes. And so does the, fund, does the money go back into the general fund? Yes. Okay. Uh, a, a second question I have is regarding the tobacco settlement allocation funds. So a big cut than I, uh, from what we were anticipating in those. And could you uh, address how exactly that will be um, handled? Well, what we have is we have about eight, let's just, 
I'm using round numbers, about $8 million in appropriation for the tobacco settlement program. We're getting about $7.2 million in, in actual revenue. So we're going to have to ramp, either ramp down those programs or continue to, to use the uh, about roughly $18 million of, of health care designation uh, to fund those uh, in for another 15 or 20, how many years that would last. So, so we're going to have to kind of try to ramp down those programs to uh, get, get them structurally balanced or continue to, to dip into the designation for health care that we set aside. That, 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 that's where it will come from, the health care agency, as opposed to the grant recipients. Well, that's, that's a board decision uh, uh, in, the, in the long run. So generally, since the health care agency is majority of the dollars, it would, it would, uh, they would pick up the majority of the cut. If we were going to cut 800000 they would probably end up picking up $750,000 of the cuts. I mean, those are just broad numbers. But, yes, in general, if, if we did a proportional cuts, yes. Okay. And, and you say that will be coming to the board. You know, my personal preference is to make sure that we're not – um, taking funds away from the nonprofits that are doing such a great job. Well, our plan right now is to continue. We'll, we're going to ride. We're going to uh, continue to see where the tobacco settlement dollars are going. Uh, we'll, we'll use the current year again. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll probably have to dip into the designation for the next year. That designation, that $18 million, has been initially set aside by unspent tobacco dollars. So it's you know a legitimate reason, a legitimate purpose mm -hmm. uh, for that for that use, uh, and we'll continue to do that for the time being until we have a real, a real uh, ability to kind of ramp down those, uh, those other programs. Okay. And, and we weren't going to do that right away. Uh, okay. We'll probably and, wait until they. As you say, we. I just want to make sure that the board has input if it's going to come to reducing the amount of money that these nonprofits are providing. You know, in terms of services that the county can't. Oh, absolutely. Uh, serve. Absolutely, we will bring that back to the board for any reduction in that regard. Okay. Correct. Thank you. The, the third, Let me just, yes. The reduction this year, reduction last year, year before, it's been ramp, it's been going like this. Yes. I, I think actuarially we thought that was going to happen too. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's going faster than actuarially speaking. I think they originally estimated about in the four four percent range. I think it's about six percent range that's okay. being reduced by. I think when this whole uh, started, there was about I want to say six hundred billion cigarettes sold in the U.S. I think back in two thousand. And now it's it's like uh, like 300 billion, 300, a little over three. So it's, right. I mean, the number of cigarettes being consumed is, has drastically reduced. Right. I mean, the idea is it's always a problem when you tag something, put set programs on something with diminishing, right. you know, That's revenue. Right. Um, and it sounds like, in one sense, we're doing what we wanted was to cut cigarette smoking down. So that that's been great. Um, but I guess then, are you going to ask like the healthcare agency and some of these agencies? To come up with a long-term plan to do this? So we yes, can... we're going to have to be ramping down those yeah, dollars. I mean, just besides ramp, but what's your long-term plan, knowing it's going to drop at an average of Our long-term plan is probably to get to about, about $6.5 million range. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, there is a, there is a uh, inflationary factor in the calculation, so it does go up by the, the amount that they have to pay goes up by 3% a year. So if the tobacco consumption <clears throat> is flat, we would still see a, uh, we would probably see about a three percent increase in those dollars per year. But if the if the tobacco dollars are going down faster than the inflationary factor is going up, then we would not we would see a reduction. I see. Okay. So at some point you're hoping you get gets to a level. Yes. We yeah we would expect that, and that's what we're, those are dollars we're going to have to work <clears throat> work down to over the long run. Okay. Thank you. And my third question is also if you uh, or maybe uh, Mr. Powers can address what's happening with the health care agency in terms of uh, their budget getting in a much better situation. So and part of this, Mr. Powers. Well, thank you, Chair Parks. Uh, <clears throat> well, yes, I think the, the health care agency and BCMC are in very strong uh, financial shape. Just paying off this loan was a real milestone. It's been been there for a while, and the county has been a big help uh, to, the, to the hospital and the health system. So but uh, it's going in a knock wood. It's going in a good direction, so they're very solid uh, financially. And uh, I see the HCA fiscal team back there in the back of the room. And uh, just to really kudos to all of you uh, here because it doesn't happen by accident. So we appreciate your great work. Good to have that loan paid yeah, off. Thank Provides you. Provides more flexibility in the future. So well, I think those are good questions and, and caution because um, we do have a strong enterprise system there, but we also know the dynamics of what's coming through um, uh, health care reform and being able to adjust and move and make sure that we, are, we're st we still are keeping things in balance and, um, and healthy. So 
it's, it's good to be able to continue with that buffer, that protection, because um, we don't know what the future clearly is going to bring to us. So, Thank you. Um, so with that, I, we have a, a motion to accept the adjustments by Supervisor Foy, second by Supervisor Long, and if we could all please vote and note that Supervisor Bennett has rejoined us. Pardon me? I need to get the back in. Okay. Well, hold and off for our technology. Just to clarify, Madam Chair, uh, that it does include the additional adjustment that I orally presented. So, thank you. Thank you. And that passes Thank you. unanimously. Uh, our next item is item 40, and that is uh, my recommendation to appoint Mel Silverberg to the Ventura County Area Agency on Aging. Mel's been a great addition to that group, serving as chair, as well as having served on the Thousand Oaks Area Age Agency. Thousand Oaks. Seen yes. <laughs> we call it their Council on Aging. And uh, if we could all please vote. And then, then we also have our correspondence agenda items 41 and 42. If we could have a motion on that. And then we'll go to board comments again so Supervisor Bennett can have his opportunity. So the consent uh, correspondence agenda then uh, passes unanimously. And uh, at this point, uh, We'll finish off our regular agenda item by turning the floor over to Supervisor Bennett for his board comments. I just to, uh, lead for, um, item 37 the record. Thank you. Okay. And then I meant the Ventura County Ordinance Code Division 1, Chapter 3, Article 4, Civil Service. I'm sorry, Civil Service. Thank you, Roberta. And Supervisor Bennett, are you ready to do your board comments? I'll Yes, I am. Thank you very much. We have, uh, just looking for my list. Sorry to rush you. I know you just came in. No problem. The, um, uh, tomorrow is the job training fair for vets, uh, um, uh, vets home in, uh, in Ventura. And uh, it's CalVet. Um, just wanted to ask other board members to make sure that they, they try to get that uh, information out as much as possible. It's from 8 until 12. And it's at the uh, veterans' home that we have here. Um, and it's a uh, opportunity for unemployed vets to, to connect up with uh, people that are looking for vets. And it's a job training and, and uh, career fair uh, item. And then um, uh, with the board's uh, support over the years, uh, 10 years ago when I came into uh, uh, office, um, the, just about the very first issue was how are the people on Old Creek Road going to deal with getting to their homes now that the, uh, they no longer had uh, the ability to go through the Girl Scout um, uh, facility and they were, they were blocked during emergencies and uh, our staff patched together grant after grant after grant um, and uh, did a wonderful job and that opening is going to be this week um, on the 29th uh, at uh, uh, 9.15 uh, and I think in this day and age when, when there's not much that government can get done uh, in, in this area, this is really a testament to staff doing a great job and, not, and being steady and, and going after it and now you're going to have that uh, Oak Creek Bridge uh, open up, which will make people a lot safer uh, that live back behind there. We had um, the thing that really, the, the incident that stimulated it was somebody pulling down in there trying to cross and their, their uh, car got caught and uh, then the water kept rising. Literally a helicopter had to come and pull them off of the roof. Uh, and um, we approve those homes, uh, and we have had that responsibility to try to solve that problem. So, anyway, that'll be the 29th if anybody is interested. Thank you. Thank you for that reminder. I would like to ask the board to adjourn in memory of the people on this list here. And uh, uh, I know you're all wondering about what this day in history is. Uh, I point out that June 28th, first of all, is Paul Bunyan Day. 
<laughs> so we're going to be celebrating Paul Bunyan and his Blue Ox Babe and their adventures around our country. Uh, June 28th, on this day in history, in 1919, the Treaty of Versailles was signed, ending World War I. 1953, workers at a Chevrolet plant in Flint, Michigan, assembled the first Corvette, a two-seater sports car that would become an American icon. It was hand-assembled and featured a polo white exterior and red interior, two-speed power glide, automatic transmission, wraparound <laughs> windshield, white wall tires, and detachable plastic curtains instead of slide window side windows. 1976, the first woman entered the U.S. Air Force Academy. And finally, in 1997, Mike Tyson bit Evander Holyfield's oh, ear in the third round of their heavyweight rematch in Las Vegas. One. Oh, can't spare that one. Um, and I, I believe, uh, unless uh, there's anything else on the regular agenda, we can go to a closed session. And are we having a closed session is a big question. No, no closed session? No closed session. So Madam Chair, I, I have to, as a result of your calendar reading, tell yes. you, you know, Indiana is a Hoosier state, but... Nobody knows what where Hoosier comes from, and, yeah. and, but the the most prevalent theory is that there were lots of barroom brawls in in Indiana back in the frontier days. And after the brawl, people would sit there drinking beer, and they'd point and say, "Who's here?" Oh. <laughs> Why did we get that? Hear that? The Mike Tyson. You know? Oh, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Uh, so with that, we'll uh, we'll go ahead and um, take a, a brief break and come back for our 10 a.m. time certain. Brief recess for our 10 a.m. time certain items, starting with item 30, which is uh, regarding some sewer service in Peru. Mr. Pakala. Good morning, Chair Parks, members of the board, Mr. Powers. Ready Pakala with Water and Sanitation Department of the Public Works Agency. I will be presenting the next four items, so bear with me for another half hour or so. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, present item uh, item 30. Uh, this is a public hearing for the purpose of collecting sewer service charges for Ventura County Waterwork District Number 16. As your board is aware, district provides sanitation services to the community of Pyro. 
in 2010, we completed a new wastewater treatment plant to comply with the Los Angeles Regional Water Quality Control Board permit requirements and also to provide needed capacity for the proposed growth within the community of Piru. We are not recommending any changes to the existing sewer charges for the upcoming fiscal year. However, we are recommending that your board adopt the resolution authorizing collection of the sewer service charges and standby charges on the annual general county tax roll. That concludes my presentation. I'll be glad to take any questions you might have. Do we have any questions or a motion? Motion by Supervisor Long, who represents the area. Second by Supervisor Zaragoza. If we could all please vote. Good work and thank you. Okay. And then thank we'll you. go ahead and move on to the next item, which is item 31. Item 31 is another public hearing for county service area number 29. County service area number 29 provides sanitation services to the com beach communities of uh, Solomar Beach, Faria Beach, Muscle Shoals, and Sea Cliff, north of city of Ventura. All of the sewage from uh, these communities is discharged to the city of Ventura for treatment and disposal. North Coast sewer system is a unique sewer system. Uh, it's about 30 years old, and the sewer system consists of uh, 13 miles of uh, sewer force main, more than 300 uh, septic systems where every house has a tank and a pump. We pump all of the sewage to the city of Ventura. Uh, Ventura Regional Sanitation District operates and maintains the sewer system and our public works agency manages and administers the budgets and the permits and uh, uh, liabilities, uh, any claims that come along within this system. Uh, and we have been looking into potentially taking over this operations from Ventura Regional Sanitation System so far. We have not uh, come up with an economical option. We'll continue to look at those options. We talked to the city of Ventura, but they were not really interested in uh, uh, doing that work at this time. Uh, but as I said, uh, we are looking into uh, potentially taking it ourselves so we can control the cost for the operation and maintenance of the system. To offset the increased cost for electrical energy and replacement of some pumps and also aging electrical instrumentation system, we are recommending a 5% sewer rate increase for upcoming fiscal year. The required Proposition 218 notices were sent to all of the property owners in the service area, I believe on May, May 13th. Uh, Clerk of the Board received one protest letter which is included in your board package. Uh, our office in Moorpark did not receive any telephone calls from our customers. We are recommending that your board adopt a resolution in our staff report authorizing a 5% sewer rate increase and also collecting these charges on the tax roll. This concludes my world of presentation. I'll be glad to take any questions you might have. Comments or questions from the board? Do we have a motion? Motion by Supervisor Bennett who represents that area. And a second from Supervisor Zaragoza, if we could all please vote. Thank you. That also passes unanimously. We can move on now to your next item, Mr. McCullough. Thank McCullough. you. Thank you. Uh, item number 32 is another public hearing for county service area number 34. CSA 34 provides sanitation services to the community of El Rio and Strickland Tract. All of the sewage uh, from uh, this community is discharged to the city of Oxnard for treatment and disposal. Uh, these areas are outside the city of Oxnard city limits. As your board is aware, uh, we recently completed 10 phases of construction for this El Rio sewer collection system. Uh, with uh, $26 million local, state, and federal grant funding, which includes our funding. And we also were able to secure approximately $9 million in state revolving loan at 1% interest for the construction of this project. Uh, we are not recommending any changes to the current service charges. 
However, recommending that your board adopt the resolution in our staff report, which includes collection of uh, sewer service charges and sewer connection fee installment payments for those property owners who have opted to take the loan in lieu of paying the lump sum for the sewer connection fee. Uh, we are recommending that these be collected on the annual tax roll. This concludes my verbal presentation. I'll be glad to take any questions you might have. Ready, real quick. Um, <clears throat> you had 100 plus homes to go the last time I heard. Are we done completely, completely now, or is that going to be uh, next month? Or uh, to date, uh, more than 13,000 homes have been connected mm -hmm. uh, to the sewer system. The 100 homes you're referring to, uh, I believe, uh, uh, 80 of those have connected. So we're down to. We are done to. 20 or so. 20 or so in those phases that we have the meeting about a month ago. Great job, too, you know, excellent program. And I think, you know, all the information you gave at the MAC and to every single meeting we had was well attended, and it's just a great job that you did there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I was wondering, um, I don't recall, was part of this looking into the future of having the city of Oxnard take over the system? Uh, that was not as part of the agreement we have with the city of Oxnard. The Elrio Mac and the, some of the residents were very opposed for them to be annexed to the city of Oxnard. Uh, at this time, we have an agreement with the city for them to continue to take the sewage from this community. Uh, now, as far as the sewer connection fee, uh, City of Oxnard was really great. Uh, they froze the connection fee at $3,500 lump sum. We froze it for several years ago. To for several years ago, when yes. you were on the City Council. So was I was just thinking from a kind of a LAFCO perspective, generally, mm -hmm. you have the city, the one that's providing the service is the, the one that oversees it and has it in their jurisdiction and all. Yes. I understand this is unincorporated area. Mm -hmm. Yes. When the CSA 34 was formed, uh, we have had discussions with the LAFCO staff. Because the uh, majority of the, uh, quite a number of property owners are opposed to annexing okay. to the mm -hmm. city, uh, LAFCO supported uh, forming a new county sewer district. But, but, uh, okay. but this work really helped the uh, Fox Canyon and all the uh, aquifers underneath the, uh, the, um, uh, you know, the Oxnard Basin. Yes, it will improve the water quality in the Oxnard Fort Bay, where United is recharging the Fox Can and GMA manages that basin. Okay, okay. and uh, uh, that's obviously what the residents want. That's what they've that's got. So, Supervisor Zaragoza mm -hmm. made the motion, second mm -hmm. by Supervisor Bennett. If we could please vote. It is nice to see that uh, chapter, <laughs> that, that bumpy chapter, finally being uh, resolved. Good to get it all on to sewer instead of septic there. Our next uh, item is your last one. You're batting a thousand so far, Mr. Bacala. <laughs> uh, again, this item 33 is a public hearing for the adoption of a resolution for the year 2010 urban water management plan for Ventura County Water Work District Number 1. Uh, as your board is aware, district uh, provides water and sanitation services to the, uh, the city of Mopark and areas to the north and west of the city. Uh, there were three letters that your board received, uh, uh, one um, uh, from uh, Zone Mutual Water Company. I'm sorry, the two letters your board received, one from Zone Mutual Water Company, uh, the other one from Ms. Jordan, uh, and uh, our office uh, received comments from Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency, and also the city of uh, uh, Moore Park. Uh, this morning when I uh, provided a memo with some changes to the plan, those were to address uh, some of the typographical errors and also comments from city of Moore Park uh, regarding the comments from uh, uh, Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency. We have addressed those comments and we have uh, uh, revised our uh, urban water management plan uh, that we presented to you in our attachment. Uh, our Fox Cannon GMA comments were addressed to their satisfaction. As far as uh, Zone Mutual Water Company, uh, those are comments very similar to Fox Cannon GMA comments, 
And as I go through the PowerPoint presentation, I'll explain to you how we addressed zones concerns. Uh, with that, I'd like to go give you a brief presentation of this plan. purpose of the urban water management plan is uh, to come up with the water resources, water supply plan for the next uh, 20 years. Uh, this uh, plan is required under the state law for any water supplier who serves more than 3,000 acre feet per year and who provides uh, water supply for more than 3,000 uh, customers. Uh, as your board is aware, uh, our office manages five water systems. Of the five water systems we manage, this is the only water district that uh, falls under the state requirement where we have to prepare the urban water management plan. And in addition, under the state law, we also have to show how we're going to reduce the water consumption by 20% by year 2020. And these have been addressed as part of this uh, plan that I'm presenting to you today. Uh, we have updated this urban water management plan four times so far. The first plan we presented to your board was in 1991, and uh, the last uh, update was in 19, uh, 2005. And this update is for year 2010. And uh, after your board, assuming that your board would approve our recommendation, we will be submitting this to the California Department of Water Resources and uh, by doing so, our district will qualify for future state grants and either, any other grants that there may be out there for the water resources planning and uh, water projects. As part of this plan, we have uh, looked at uh, uh, what are our demands during a dry, normal year, dry year, and multiple dry years. We believe our district is uh, in a good shape compared to other water suppliers because we, we have multiple sources of water supply. We have imported water supply, we have local water supply, the recycled water, and also I'll be talking about the brackish groundwater desalination later on. Uh, as far as the imported water, your board is very aware that uh, water comes from state water projects through metropolitan, through Cayuga's municipal water district. And the Cayugas Municipal Water District Board has adopted their urban water management plan in, on May 18th of this year. That plan incorporates Metropolitan Water District Integrated Water Management Plan. And that particular plan, Metropolitan, identifies how they are going to secure water supplies for entire Southern California uh, that uh, covers all the counties from San Diego to Ventura. And Metropolitan Water District plan also includes how they would get additional supplies during a drought or multi-year droughts. As you have seen last couple of years when the Metropolitan uh, reservoirs were depleting, they have come up with a 15% reduction goals and most of the water purveyors have met those goals. In particular, District 1 met 22% reduction in our goal for this fiscal year. So our, our customers have responded to our request to cut back on their water usage, and we were able to meet those goals. As far as the local water supply, uh, we, District 1 owns six groundwater wells. We operate, maintain those wells. Uh, 
these basins are managed by Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency. So Professor Bennett sits on this agency. At this time, they are looking at uh, uh, Las Posas Subbasin Management Plan, where they would be looking into bringing these uh, basins to safe yield. And we have been participating in these meetings with the Zone Mutual Water Company and other pumpers in this basin uh, to come up with a sensible way of uh, uh, producing more high-quality water from South Las Posas Basin. As for the reclaimed water system, uh, district has existing reclaimed water system. We treat 1.5 million gallons per day at the Moorpark Wastewater Treatment Plant. We have been using this water since 19, uh, 2005 uh, to irrigate the 27-hole golf course by Country Club Estates. And uh, I'm happy to report to you, I have in the past reported to you that we were able to get $1 million grant for this expansion of the reclaimed water system. That project is under construction as we speak. We expect to complete that project by end of this calendar year and we'll be adding more customers. Uh, as, we, as the sewage fl inflow to the treatment plant increases, we'll be increasing our customers, adding more customers to the reclaimed water system. This particular slide gives you what our demands were uh, in year, calendar year 2010. Uh, as you can see, uh, we have municipal agriculture and recycled water, and our demand and supply equals uh, uh, equal to, uh, in year 2010. This was one of the lowest uh, uh, demands uh, in the last 10 years or so because of the above, above average rainfall and also our customers responding to our request to reduce their water usage. But while you have that slide up, um, th that heavy reliance on imported water is, uh, uh, is, is always going to be a, a long-term risk factor. Right? Uh, this particular slide gives you normal year uh, every year 2015, 20, 25, 30, 35. It shows you what the, uh, where the demand is and uh, where the supplies are. Uh, what I'd like to point out uh, is uh, 5,000 uh, acre feet per year of recovered groundwater. This is a Moor Park desalter project that we have identified in our urban water management plan. Your board may recall about a year ago, uh, you approved a consultant services contract for us to prepare a preliminary design report for the Moor Park desalter project. Uh, we uh, recently uh, completed the report based on the available technical information we have identified, we could produce as much as 5,000 acre feet per year from this Moorpark desalter. Uh, however, we also know that we need to do some pilot testing to confirm that 5,000 acre feet per year of yield from this, base, from this uh, proposed project. At this time, uh, we are uh, moving forward uh, with, uh, prepare, with drilling wells to confirm the yield based on the studies that we will be doing, pilot testing, then we will identify the uh, yield of this Moorpark wastewater treatment plant, whatever that yield will be. Uh, we'll be coordinating with uh, Las Posas Group. Uh, we have to get approval from GMA before we actually move forward with the EIR process for the Moorpark desalter. And as you can see, we also identified 10,000, 10,000 uh, beginning 2000, 2000, 2020, uh, and uh, the reason we, we did this in the report was our concept is the South Las Posas Basin is full at this time. So once we start extracting this uh, shallow, salty groundwater, we'll be creating underground space for more surface water to be recharged. So b based on the 5,000 acre foot per day, uh, treatment plant, we have enough data to identify whether we can expand our capacity to next level. So these are all based on actual studies, actual ha what's happening in the field. The reason we did this, this is a plan. The plan is based on the available data. That's the reason we identified these numbers. We very well understand zones concern that uh, we are claiming this. We should not be claiming without further studies. We are in 100% agreement that we will be doing the needed studies. We will be getting the GMA approval before we move forward with the EIR process for this Moorpark Desalter Phase 1 project.
this particular slide shows you single dry year. Uh, next one, multiple dry years. Uh, you went pretty fast through those. Could you go back? Oh, uh, you want me to go back? Let's go multiple dry years, please. Multiple dry years. The EIR on it would identify the water quality issues. Yes. How uh, that's being pumped into the ground. Yes. So. If you like, I can walk through that under the projected supplies, uh, we are projecting uh, by 2015, we will have 1,100 acre foot per year of demand. Uh, as uh, inflow to the wastewater treatment plant increases, we would be adding more reclaimed water customers. Uh, at the recovered groundwater, there's a Murpak desalination, proposed Murpak desalination project. That's the one I mentioned earlier, 5,000 is a preliminary planning uh, uh, number that uh, we are uh, we are looking at uh, once we have the pilot testing completed that number would either go down or stay where it is uh, and the potable groundwater that's uh, uh, our GMA allocations uh, we, be, we are on historical allocations and that's our current allocations uh, and the imported supply uh, you see year 2020 it goes down because we are showing the local groundwater uh, uh, being uh, replacing the imported water supply. If you look at the comment on the bottom of this slide, uh, this is in response to Fox Canyon and also to zone mutual comments, where we are saying this 5,000 or 10,000 acre feet will be subject to Fox Canyon GMA board approval and also uh, Cayugas Municipal Water District bringing their salinity management slash brine line to Moore Park area we have been working with Cayegas for the last several years. Uh, initially, uh, they told us uh, that would be coming to Moore Park by 2015. That's the reason we put that in here. Uh, however, if uh, that gets delayed, our proposed project will also be delayed. So you've got um, 7,000 uh, acre feet of imported water projected for 2015 in a multiple dry year. Drops down to three, then close to four, five, and five. Uh, and let's go back and compare that with uh, the normal year that you had up before. You had it down quite a bit lower than that in terms of imported supply, right? Correct. This is a normal year. Normal year, so 5,111, and that's because the demand goes up as the, uh, in the multiple dry years. Now, during multiple dry years, um, the possibility of us increasing our imported water um, may, be a, may be a challenge, correct? Uh, under the existing metropolitan plan, uh, their stated position is uh, they would sell the water you need at a higher cost. They would be buying water maybe by, from farmers by following some of the land. Uh, or they may be, they're also looking into ocean desalination. As a matter of fact, right now they are funding a three project for ocean desalination in San Diego and Riverside counties. And they are looking into subsidizing uh, ocean desalination within their service area. So Metropolitan's plan clearly shows that uh, a sub-agency like Cayegas or the purveyors like us can get more water, however, they'll be subject to two. One would be higher price, the other one would be subject to uh, increased water conservation measures like uh, reduce your consumption by 10% or 15%. If, if a given purveyor does not, you may be subject to penalties like three times the normal rate. That's how their plan is set up right now. So, so their plan is going to call for if we have dry years, we're going to have significantly higher water higher rates. Higher costs, correct. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. It's all still. I mean, it, yes, it's, it's going to be still a challenge in, in dry years. With, with yes. it, everybody's going to need more supply, and uh, it's going to be very difficult to come up with it. Thank you. And how little of that translates into policies at the state in terms of more development, more growth, and not even paying attention to the fact that there isn't a water source. Ready. 
You yes. didn't make a change in port portable water. It does. Your our local water doesn't change in dry years. You're not expecting a, a drop in that. I noticed on your. Not uh, the way it stands today. Okay. But if GMA were to change their allocations to each pumper, that may change down the line. But right now, it does not change during dry years. Okay. Now, these are some of the current water conservation programs in place. Uh, as I mentioned, last couple of years uh, when we had to cut back by 15 percent, uh, uh, our bill inserts uh, to our customers uh, helped us a great deal. Um, we also have la large landscape water surveys we do within our service area. Again, just th these are just within our service area, the Moore Park, our Bell Canyon, our Lake Sherwood. Uh, we also have water-wise gardening workshops. Uh, we offer classes on Saturdays uh, to our customers, property owners, who can come and learn about the native plants and uh, efficient irrigation systems. Uh, we have had a lot of interest for our customers to come to those classes. As a matter of fact, Mayor Parvin and uh, council members came to the last meeting we had in Moore Park. Uh, and we also have Water Awareness Month pu public outreach school education program. We are partnering with the city of Moore Park, uh, putting our water conservation tips on the local TV station. We want to thank city of Moore Park for their cooperation. And also we have all the brochures that we hand out at the city hall. Uh, we do partner with Cayegas and Metropolitan on the uh, rebates to the extent they're available. They have gone down quite a bit in their rebate funding. And our plan to meet our water conservation goals will continue the existing uh, water conservation, public education. Uh, one of our main objectives is to continue to expand the tertiary treatment facility, our plant at the Moorpark Wastewater, that will uh, replace our imported water supplies. Uh, when you look at the urban water management plan, anytime you have the local reclaimed water, that accounts for your reduction in goal. So th that helps you a great deal. Um, and of course, we'll continue to encourage large, large landscape customers. We have been talking to the homeowners associations in Moore Park area. If they have an opportunity to convert their systems into reclaimed water systems, we have been working with them. I think we have a great potential. We just had a meeting with about 20 of our potable customers who are very close to the uh, proposed uh, reclaimed water expansion project. They are very excited to convert into reclaimed water usage, and also they'll be saving anywhere between 10 to 15 percent of their water bills by doing so. And lastly, what you see on this uh, slide is a construct a new Moor Park desalination project. As I said, it will have less dependence upon imported water. We will address the comments from Zone, and as I mentioned, we have addressed the comments from Fox Canyon to their satisfaction. We are recommending that your board adopt the resolution of a staff report. That concludes my presentation. I'll be glad to take any questions you might have. Um, I was wondering if there are other opportunities for expansion of the gray water, the use of um, reclaimed water, if that's part of uh, the goal. It's also to find more avenues for that, maybe looking towards residential landscaping opportunities. Yeah. As you may be aware, state law authorizes uh, uh, use of gray water. Now, state, uh, city building official and county building official actually have that on the website. If any customer is interested in uh, putting in a gray water system, they directly go to the building and safety. They get the permit. In our website, we tell them the great, we encourage gray water. If anybody is interested, they should be talking to the city and the county building officials to install those systems. So they're finding what something like 50 to 70 percent of the water is being used just for landscaping. If we can help to encourage that, yes. we can reduce water consumption. Yes. Okay. I, no other questions from the board? Then uh, we have a, this is a public hearing, correct? And so I'll go ahead and close the public hearing not having any cards and uh, ask for a motion. <laughs> And uh, a motion by Supervisor Foy and a second from Supervisor Long. If we could all please vote. Thank you very much. Thank you, Beth. Thank Ready? you. Good work. Ready.
And that concludes our, our 10 a.m. time certains, and we can come back at 11 for the Air Pollution Control Board.
Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the afternoon session of the Board of Supervisors, where we will be looking at item 34, which is our 1.30 p.m. time certain, a public hearing for the adoption, hopefully, finally, of our housing element. And this uh, is a public hearing, and we ask that you get all your blue comment cards in, public speaker cards, if you want to speak. You can also have the opportunity to write something if you don't want to speak on one of the yellow cards. Ask that you uh, put your phones on silent if you have them with you. And uh, I think we'll go ahead and begin. Our planning department is ready. We'll begin with a, our staff report on this. Uh, actually, it's been approved once, but then uh, got put on hold, and we had to make some more revisions. So it's been a, a few years, but we're back. And as you said, we're here for round two of the housing element revisions. Um, I'm Kari Finley with the Planning Division, and my associate and I, um, Shelley Sussman, have been working on this for some time now, and we're bringing forward to you this general plan amendment and zone, um, zoning ordinance amendments for consideration. Um, we also have available for um, questions and comments and, and um, to verify technical um, support from uh, Mr. Smith and Ms. Pearlhart, and then also we have representatives from other county agencies here, um, the Human Services Agency and the Fire Department and any other folks you may have questions of. Um, are probably someone here available. <laughs> Many of these revisions, amendments, as, as you indicated, um, are um, you presented to you today, have already previously come to you in draft form in July 2009, um, with the exception of the EIR founding, findings and some other updates to the resources and hazards appendices. Um, just quickly, um, as an outline so you can see where we're headed with this, um, this presentation. Um, I'm going to cover some background and then the revisions that we're proposing to the resources and hazards appendices which are new to you that you did not see in July 2009. And then also the, briefly cover the revisions to the housing elements since the last time we, we visited you in July 2009. And also I'm going to talk about the residential rezoning program or the new RHD zone. Um, then after that, my associate, Shelley Sussman, will be covering the other program implementation portions that include farm worker complex, um, creating substandard parcels for farm worker um, complexes, um, second dwelling units, and emergency shelters, and then we'll wrap up with recommendations. Um, briefly, the history, as you're aware, we adopted this, this housing element was adopted by your board in July 2008. And we sent it to the State Housing, Department of Housing and Community Development for a required certification review, and they did not certify it. So we came back in February 2009 with proposed work program and um, for your approval, and we looked at some um, draft language in July of 2009, and with the, your recommendations for RHD sites and consideration of emergency shelter in the CPD zone, we went forward and prepared an EIR. Um, in August 2009, we submitted it pursuant to state law to HCD again for their review, the, this next round draft, and received some comments from them. And then from August 2009 until May, we were engaged in the EIR process and refining the drafts that we brought to you previously. And then June 2nd, we, we had a public hearing in front of the Planning Commission. Um, again, in November 2008, we received comments from HCD. Those are what we brought to you before. Primarily, they were um, based on comments that were based on um, that they did not agree with some of the assumptions we had for our land inventory, such as um, second dwelling unit inventory, and they directed us to go forward with implementation of SB2 that concerns the the emergency shelter provisions and transitional and supportive housing definitions. Um, then in October 2009, once we visited you with the second draft revisions, um, we submitted it and the comments they came back with were to implement, to go forward and implement this adequate sites program, which is the Arch Day D rezoning, and then also the emergency shelter program. And then they said if we met those provisions, we should be able to be certified. Um, 
briefly, the project objectives then are to comply with state housing element law to get a certified housing element so that we will be eligible for any state or federal funding. Because if we're not certified by the state, then we're not eligible for funding to implement these programs and actually realize you know, lower-income housing and emergency shelter grants. So that's the importance, the big, biggest piece of this. Um, also, we, and in order to do that, we need to address HCD comments by implementing these programs. You can see several of them are state mandated. And also, to comply with state laws, this is the new piece that um, requires updating with your next housing element. Also, we have to update our safety and conservation elements. So. Um, just briefly, we um, primarily had to update background information, references to state agencies and maps and flood areas and groundwater recharge areas. And so we worked with the County Sheriff's Office of Emergency Services, the Public Works Agency and the Watershed Protection District to update the, all this data. And then the state law also requires that we have these, these elements reviewed by state agencies, so we sent it to the California Emergency Management Agency, the California Geological Survey Department of Conservation, and um, the State Board of Forestry and Fire Protection. So they reviewed all these and did not provide any comments on our draft revisions. But this is something else that we're, we're requesting your approval of today, these amendments to our what constitutes our safety and conservation elements, and those are provided as Exhibits 2.2 and Exhibit 2.3. Um, now on to the proposed revisions to the housing element. As you're aware, our housing, the county's housing element is comprised of the land use appendix, Chapter 3.3, which is population housing, and then also the goals, policies, and programs, which is, those are included as Exhibits 2.1 and 2.4. Um, this housing element, the planning period is defined as 2006 to 2014, and um, our primary revisions include um, identifying the in adequate land inventory for development of, to meet our housing needs. Um, the land inventory that we're most concerned with or that's problematic for us includes the, um, the lower income categories, and that's a combination, of, you may have seen in, in some graphs, of low, very low, and extremely low income, and we group them all and call them lower income category. Um, we do not have a deficit or identified problems meeting our moderate and upper income housing needs. Um, the result is a remaining current need that's identified in our land use appendix of 394 units. Um, I'm just going to touch on this real quickly, the comments and things they asked us to revise that, const that we, where we came up with that 394. Could I, I ask you? Oh, okay, maybe you'll answer it then. I was just wondering about the 28 that's been identified versus the 394. Yes, that's coming up next. And that's, that's fine. Um, so basically we, we redid this inventory and addressed these issues and came up with the um, identified um, 366 uh, inventory available for 366 units. So I'm going to back way up. The, the regional housing needs allocation provided us with a required 555 units. When you subtract what has been constructed in this planning period, there are 394, which is the remaining need. And then when we look at our inventory, which is land available for development of additional lower income units, we, we identified enough for 366 units. And that's how we came up with the 28 unit deficit. Does that answer your question? It's all reduce, reducing the number. So that kicked us into having to do the rezoning program. Um, so first we had to identify sites, um, which we brought forward and you, you told us to go forward with an EIR back in 2009, in the summer. Um, these are the criteria we used, um, just for, for a refresher on that. Um, we began with a list of 22 units. It was narrowed down to 14 units. And then in July, 
we came down with our sites, I'm sorry, 22 sites, and um, narrowed down to 14 sites, and um, we ended up with eight. And this is some of the, the criteria we used, that they were vacant or underdeveloped within a sphere of influence, area of interest, existing community, that they have a meet the minimum parcel size requirement, what other environmental constraints there might be. We researched and had site visits. We discussed this with sewer and water purveyors, contacted property owners. We went, met, met with cities, LAFCO, and other county agencies, and we ended up with these eight sites. And these are the ones that we, we brought before you previously. Um, we've assigned numbers to them just for reference, but uh, in summary, we have two sites in Piru area, two sites in the San Susana Pass Road area, one in the Strickland Acres area next to Rio Mesa and High School, and then three in the El Rio community. So the, the requirement for the program is that we devise a zone where um, the multifamily high density residential could be constructed. This in our zoning code required a new zone, and we call it the residential high density zone or the RHD zone, and that's attached in Exhibit 3. That uh, provides all the revisions to the non-coastal zoning ordinance, and this is a big part of that. It's a new zone. Um, the first three bullet points here signify, or they represent what the state law mandates that we include, and that is that we allow multifamily residential development by right, which means that it cannot be discretionary or require an additional public hearing or be subject to CEQA, and also that we have a minimum parcel size that could accommodate 16 units. That's one of the provisions in the state law, which defines the 0.8 minimum parcel size at 20 units to acre. The second set of bullets are the portions that staff um, created, and um, our housing team spent a lot of time on this with um, developing comprehensive development standards, including height and setbacks and open space, and then other operational standards that would mitigate some potential environmental impacts, um, design standards to ensure that we don't end up with just a big box that houses people, but something that looks interesting. And then these are all going to be regulated by the issuance of an RHD zoning clearance. And along with that zoning clearance, we've um, requested that you approve a deposit fee in order to process the application and make sure it meets all these standards. And for this RHD zoning clearance, it would be $1,200. And um, that allows for eight hours of staff time, and it's comparable to um, other similar type permits. It's actually a little bit less because it wouldn't be going through the public hearing process. Um, because it's a new type of permit, we didn't um, have a, want to give a set fee because um, it would be consistent with the cost recovery program for permit processing. Okay, and that brings me to the environmental review. Um, Staff prepared a supplemental EIR. It was in a supplement to the 2005 general plan EIR for the general plan update. We evaluated 24 issue areas, and many of those issue areas are multifaceted, so there was a lot more than 24 issues. Um, so you have a 300 and some page document in front of you. Um, that's included as Exhibit 7.1, and all the appendices are in Exhibit 7.2. We also evaluated, as required by CEQA, uh, five project alternatives. And the SEIR is organized under two project components. Um, component A consists of the eight RHD sites that I will be talking about. And then component B is all the other um, amendments that we're making to the non-coastal zoning ordinance that would allow new development. And Shelley Sussman will be speaking about those in a couple minutes. For process, um, the draft ER was circulated um, last fall for public review and comment. And then um, subsequent to the close of that review period, we had some new information that indicated that the mitigation we were relying on for the groundwater quality impacts um, was not accurate. So we prepared a new analysis with new mitigation that um, 
arrived at the same conclusion that there was no there would be no significant impacts with implementation and that had to be recirculated pursuant to to CEQA and caused some delay um, and it, it basically concludes that they need to demonstrate that there's water available or they don't get their permit um, all the public comments we received for both these public review periods are included in Exhibit 7.2, and um, they've been properly distributed to all the commenting persons. Um, just um, for an overview, for I'm going to just talk about the EIRs that pertains to these RHD sites. Um, there were 12 significant unmitigable, unmitigatable impacts for the RHD sites that were identified in the ER that would require a statement of over overriding considerations. And six of these 12 impacts apply across the boards to every site. So in short, all of these sites have constraints, but when it comes down to it, they're, they're, simil they're largely similar. There are quite a few um, environmental impacts that are the same. These, the first five of these six, um, the air quality, pedestrian, bicycle access, bus transit, public libraries, and growth inducement are all cumulative impacts. So they're, they're impacts that are beyond just these projects that were identified. Um, now I'm going to focus a little closer on each of these sites to give you some background and context. Um, the first two sites, this is a context slide. See if I can get, oops, uh-oh. <laughs> My back, uh-oh, there it is. Need the pointer one. It's this one. Okay. Just for context, these are Piru. This larger site on the bottom is site one, and it's about five and a half acres. Just under that, it currently contains an orchard and a single-family dwelling. And if it were rezoned, it could yield 109 units. Um, for context here, this is State Route 126. This is Pacific Avenue, the railroad line, the old railroad line, and up here, this is Camulo Street. That um, is at the bottom of, of site two. Site two is a one and a half acres and is currently used for, for nursery storage and, um, but not developed. And if it were rezoned, it could yield 30 units. Um, getting, looking closer at site one, again, 109 units. There was only one additional impact that was unmitigatable for sites one and two that has to do with cumulative law enforcement personnel. Um, our project alternatives in the EIR consider rezoning only the lower half to mitigate some of the potential impacts, and one of those would be um, potential impacts to parks because in this this portion, is, this is currently designated in the Piru area plan as CF, which is a uh, could accommodate a one-acre park for the community, and if we rezone the entire site, that that opportunity would go away. So one of the alternatives was to, to rezone only the lower portion. Um, if that were the case, then it would yield a potential 54 units and still meet the 28 um, deficit that we've identified. Um, something that we, that we weighed very heavily in making our recommendations concerns the, um, um, whether or not the property owner was interested in the rezoning program. And that was kind of the final pushover in, in many cases. And so staff recommended the sites where the property owners were interested. And um, you're going to see that as we go through here, as I, as I go through these sites. Um, because this property owner was not interested, um, that was one of the main reasons we did not recommend this site. Um, this is site two in Piru. Um, Similar, um, if this site were rezoned, it's 30 units and it, it would um, meet the unmet need of 28 units because it's 30 units all by itself. So um, staff recommended this site, but the Planning Commission removed this site from the recommendation. Um, they were concerned, they had a lot of concerns about this site being, because it's in Peru, that there, there's already been a, several sites recently um, developed and approved for lowering capacity in the Piru area. Um, there was some concern about this, this cumulative law enforcement um, issue. And then also the, uh, 
um, remoteness of the area and the lack of bus service. Well, Mike, just a small correction. There have been um, uh, in the area plan, as Bruce knows well, lots of uh, sites approved, let me say, units approved on a couple big sites, but nothing's, no shovel in the ground at all with any of it at this point. And whether or not um, this one down the road, um, probably within this housing element period, may or may not be germane to impacts on that. Okay. Good point. Okay. Um, then that's the Piru sites. Um, then moving forward, um, this is a contact side for the two sites in Santa Susana Pass Road. Um, they're obviously they're side by side. Um, and for context, the this comes down, the Cuner Drive comes down here and it turns into Santa Susana Pass Road. This is the railroad. And then this, this is City of Simi Valley. Um, these sites are zoned C1 and this whole portion here is zoned C1 currently. So we would be rezoning, proposing to rezone these two sites to RHD. Um, they're both about one acre. They would yield 21 and 20 units respectively. Um, the SER, <coughs> excuse me, did not identify any additional unmitigatable impacts for these two sites. And both of these property owners are um, interested in rezoning. If, um, if just, oops, obviously, if only one of these sites were rezoned, they would not achieve the 28 unit deficit. So we have recommended both of these sites be rezoned. Um, site 5 is located on Central Avenue. Uh, excuse me, on the last one, can you yes. tell me uh, what is the commercial building next door? Oh, certainly. I meant to do that. I'm sorry. This, this is a church. And right across the street, this is a church. And then there, are off to the side here, let me go back one more. Um, these uses here are mixed kind of industrial and commercial and open storage sites. And then across here in Simi, this is a big, I, I believe it's a, a movie studio building. A movie building. studio? Thank you. I may, I may get correction on that one. I'm not positive on that. You're right. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Now we are in Str the Strickland Acres area. This is Central Avenue, Rio Mesa High School, and the Strickland Tract. It's almost 10-acre site by far the largest site we've looked at. Currently it's planted in row crops. And if the entire site were rezoned, it would yield almost 200 units. Um, this has been our most problematic site. There are a lot of issues and additional unmitigatable impacts with this site. Um, our project alternative, similar to the, the site one in Piru, um, looks at rezoning only a portion of this. this is just conceptual, and that's approximately what, what approximately two acres would look like if it were rezoned, and that would achieve about 40 units. Um, however, this property owner is not interested, and given all the other problematic issues, we did not recommend that the site be rezoned at this time. Then um, our last area here is the El Rio area, and these three sites are all um, clustered together here. Um, in our context, this is Struby Street and Cortez. There's the 101 Freeway and Vineyard Avenue. This is an old Home Depot site and Rio School. Um, these top two boxes are collectively Site 6. This lower one is Site 7, and the little one is Site 8. Um, currently, the 6 and 7 have one single-family dwelling and greenhouses. Um, and then Site 8 is used as an open storage. It's not developed. It has just equipment storage yard on it. Um, site 6 is, could, could accommodate up to 108 units. Um, one of the project alternatives also considers only rezoning this portion of the site. The whole site is both these APNs, 
this one would yield 53 units if it were rezoned, and it would help to mitigate some of the potential impacts that were identified in the EIR. Um, however, these, the site, and the same with Site 7, the property owner was not willing. Um, they were primarily concerned with um, the fact that they have these wholesale nurseries on the sites, and they thought that they wouldn't be able to continue using them in that um, manner. Um, that, and that's, that's not the case. They would be able to continue using it. Um, but there were other, some other infrastructure constraints, and the fact that one of the impacts we identified was growth inducement, and that would um, eliminate it. Well, if we rezoned all of them, that would be a total of 555 units. And so we um, brought forward a scaled-down version of that, a, kind of a compromised version. Um, site 7, similar um, issues to Site 6 and right adjacent to it. And then last, um, Site 8, this is our smallest site. It could yield 16 units. It's the very minimum parcel size. This property owner is interested. It's the smallest site in this area, so it would have the least impacts on the existing infrastructure, um, but by itself would not meet the 28-unit deficit, so an additional site would need to be rezoned. Um, then, finally, I just wanted to touch on the alternatives we consider because they're required by CEQA. We looked at five different alternatives. The first two were considered not to be feasible. Um, obviously, 5.1, the no project alternative would would not result in rezoning of any or, or any rezoning. So that's not feasible to meet the project objectives. The alternative site locations we've already looked at as I said, 22 sites, then 14, and then 8, so would likely mo result in greater environmental impacts. Um, we've already looked at these as I went through each of the sites. This alternative considers just rezoning a portion of each of these sites, 1 and 5 and 6, and obviously would result in less impacts. The fourth alternative is considers only rezoning enough to meet the unmet need with full development of all the sites. And these are the sites and the combinations that would meet those needs. Um, and then finally, the environmentally superior preferred alternative identified in the EIR is a combination of the last two alternatives. And it, it involves reducing the size of 1, 5, and 4, 6, and any combination that would meet the current need. And if this would allow the required density, it would satisfy the minimum required number of units, and it would reduce impacts for the three larger sites or avoid environmental impacts for those that were not selected. But that said, staff and the Planning Commission still recommended, staff recommended four sites, Planning Commission recommended the three sites, three and four, and site eight to meet some of the current and future need um, for meeting our RANA numbers, um, the next cycle is already starting. If we identify land in, and have inventory now that's not constructed, it carries into the next cycle, and that was an important piece that we thought we shouldn't miss that with the fact that we've been through all of this environmental review on these sites at this time. Um, if these three sites are rezoned, 3, 4, and 8, that would result in 57 units. And if Site 2 is added to that, that would be 87 units. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Shelley, unless you have questions on the RTD yeah. sites now. Let me, <coughs> Madam Chair. Supervisor Zaragoza. On the, uh, the three sites are where? On Santa Susana and El Rio and... Two in Santa Susana. Two in two Santa, Santa Susana and one in El Rio. You know, I, um, I'm just looking at uh, some of the comments that we got here uh, from uh, some of the... Uh, letters that we got is uh, some of the issues are probably water is a problem. Should we, shouldn't we be um, recommending all sites, all sites, you know, subject to getting water in the future? Uh, and, and, and that, because that's affordability really, yeah. is so important you know, to, to probably all areas of the county because of the individuals have to drive back and forth from one job or from their job back to their house and so forth. And especially in Oxnard, I know in Oxnard we provide a lot of affordable housing for 
for individuals that work in other cities. And it would be kind of nice to have affordable housing where those individuals work, whether they have water now or maybe water in the future. You know. Um, I think we would all agree with you that that would be optimal. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the water issues are going to need to be resolved at some point, and and they probably will be at some point, but um, that's really at the discretion of your board. So you're recommending that we only submit uh, the three sites, one, five, and six? Um, we were, we're actually recommending um, three, four, and eight. Well, I'm sorry, three, four, but mm -hmm. in ideally, I think the El Rio sites, and, and staff has discussed this at length, that the, the El Rio sites are the closest to urban services, and we think that that's a good area, but the, there are some significant water um, purveyor constraints that, that may, uh, we just don't know what the timing is on those, and we thought that it would be prudent to um, forward a recommendation that was, was um, provided some um, inventory for the future and had greater potential for being developed in this One of the letters period. that I'm, I'm looking at, one of the letters that was submitted uh, here by uh, uh, one of the agencies says, in order to comply with state housing element law, it would appear that the county should include all eight sites for rezoning to high density to provide maximum opportunity for housing to, for lower house, uh, lower income housing to be built within the plan period, which gives an opportunity to include the possibility of obtaining federal tax dollars and so forth. That, that's what prompted me to say, why can't we include all sites, and, whether and they are denied or if, not? If I may comment okay. on this point. Staff's recommendation is a balance between the, the unmet need we have, which is 28 units, and the maximum of all eight sites together is 500 and 55. 55. Mm -hmm. So that clearly is significantly above our immediate need. Mm -hmm. It is true that in the next housing cycle, we may be back asking for more sites to be rezoned. Mm -hmm. But what we did is we weighed the fact that the, at least four of the property owners are desirous of the rezoning at this time, and we felt that since that met both our need and some of the need for the next cycle, that was the balance between the two. Your board could approve all eight sites. Mm -hmm. Whether we have water or not, but they could be approved and subject to water. Or if we get no water, then there's... Nothing happens, right? Is well, all sites are subject to having water. adequate potable water supply that meets fire flow standards. Mm -hmm. And it's really an engineering solution. Mm -hmm. And with that said, I want to just uh, comment that, that one of the exhibits, the statement of overriding considerations and the findings in your packet, includes what you need to approve all the sites if you choose to do so. Um, and, and so we've done all the staff work as though the whole project were going to be approved. And, and the last sentence here says to, to comply with the housing element law, all eight sites should be included for rezoning for higher density. So uh, that's not a correct statement. That's not. The state law only requires that we, we rezone sites sufficient to meet our unmet need. We don't have to rezone all 500 or well, that's all my intention. Sense. That's why I wanted to find out, you know, where we stood on that, you know, and because mm -hmm. uh, you know, affordable housing is should, you know, is required throughout the county. So, in order to eliminate, uh, you know, uh, employees driving from one side of the county to the other kind of site. You know, so. okay, I've got a few more questions from the different supervisors, and then some cards. But I you're, just wanted you're to, before we left it, that's sure. why I wanted to answer. Uh, your comments yeah. are noted, and I have a Supervisor Foy and Long and Bennett, and I think Supervisor Foy was first. One, let me just ask you, on um, just the sites in Santa Susana, um, when you recommended that site, it would hold so many units. Did you take into account that there's probably going to, if you did that, there would have to be maybe some type of a special lane put on that road? That's a high-speed road that's got lots and lots of traffic on it, and I don't know. If it, I don't know if the acreage, because they're not very big sites, you'd have to have some type of turnoff where you get out. You'd have to have some kind of lane put in, because I mean, coming, I take that, go that road a lot. And a lot of people, it's it's you know, it's real crowded, it's real fast, 
and I don't know how you would on an acre site, only an acre each, I think. Um, yes, we, we looked at that in the traffic analysis mm -hmm. and with um, the county traffic engineer, and we determined that the right of way is such that there's enough shoulder to put in a, a acceleration lane to be able to to get going. The you know, to get up to speed when you're merging into the that. And then there's also a middle lane right there in front of the site as well, you know, two way left turn lane. Mm -hmm. Um, which could be used to for for traffic turning the other direction. The the bigger issue that we found in there was in the EIR was that the that curve and the sight distance was was uh dangerous. Yeah, and I mean there's no question that's a pretty dangerous road and if you mm -hmm. had a a lot of people coming out of that, and even people walking through there, it, it seemed pretty dangerous. The other side of that is, you know, we're going through the idea now. They're putting in, they're putting new tanks in for water and all that. But I don't think this property is able to use that water. So, I know water was part of your issue. How are you dealing with? If you approve that this is one, and somebody wanted to do this, a willing owner, there's no water. So, what do you deal with that? How do you? Well, I think the the water issue largely stems from a, a lack of storage for fire flow, uh -huh. and when we initially started the the process, the um, there was a tank site that was under negotiation to address that issue. There were two different tanks, and one was constructed, and the second tank was under negotiations, and those negotiations fell by the side. Right, right. They have funding for it. It's ready to go, but they don't have a site. Well, as I say, because most of those areas up there, there's really no sites left. And so I'm just trying to – I mean, if you – when I'm just, you know, looking at it from just a real practical standpoint, because it sounded like you had an interested property owner to do this, but you say, okay, that's one of our sites, but if we can't get water, I know that... Well, and, and I, my discussions, I, I talked with the city staff, that's why we're state, that serves that area, and with my discussions mm -hmm. with them, they indicated that they, f they thought that there were other means you could use besides just the storage to provide firefighting capabilities. The... And until you have a project in front of you, you can't fully examine, and, you know, what the needs are. And it would come out like it would with any of these sites because they all have similar issues with fire flow for either water storage reasons or, or whatnot. And um, and they thought, you know, you bring bring us a, a, a project and we think that we can work with you. We also have um, – Larry Williams from the Fire Protection District, if, if you wanted to pursue that question. Well, well, I understand, okay, from the fire flow issue, but there was times before we this tank, I mean, the people just draw down the water, even without fire issues. There wasn't just enough water. I'm sure the residents could tell you that there wasn't. But I was also thinking with that that area, I didn't think across the street that water was going to that area across the street. So is that... Um, there, there is a water line there that that could hook to those sites. Those sites have have a potable water source. Okay. All right, but anyway, I think the the other side of that is trying to figure out that road issue because that is a one fast, dangerous road. And I hate to have people as you come around those curves, people coming out of that. And there's a provision in the RHD ordinance code that requires them to meet all the road standards, the highway capacity manual standards, standards, and the county road standards right. for right. site safety. Thank you. Supervisor Long, then well, Supervisor Bennett. Just a, a couple of quick comments. I think um, I just looked at the interested or willing property owners, and you have slides two, three, four, and eight, and it's 87 total units, and our target is 28. Yes. Now, that, I, I think some of the board's discussion is what is the first priority here beyond the fact that we have a uh, responsibility to provide um, this uh, mix of housing, and so what's the first priority in, in um uh, giving a point value, let's say, to some of the criteria, certainly water being one, and, and but having a willing property or interested property owner ought to be right at the top of the list because I doubt there's any one of us up here who wants to exercise them in a domain, even for the housing element. That would be Peter does. <laughs> that, that might be tough. Um, so uh, just you know, so thinking of, and as and this is just for discussion. Think of as we move through this discussion and hear from the public as to then how do what are those priority points and and you know obviously. Um, this is the plan we put forward, and this is our plan that says to the state, we believe we've done enough analysis that these particular sites are uh, quality sites that could move ahead. 
but when it comes down to actually putting a um, uh, shovel in the dirt, there's additional analysis that would be done, and then it may be ruled in or out based on whether or not it really can either acquire water or meet the traffic issue or et cetera. But um, for us to reach a target of 28 and just to start from that first initial tough um, public issue of taking property, two, three, four, and eight rise to the top. Supervisor Bennett? Um, you mentioned that um, uh, staff's trying to strike a balance. Uh, with, with, with regard to the question of, of why not rezone all eight sites, the staff's trying to reach a balance, uh, and that uh, it doesn't mean these sites aren't going to surface again. How far are we? Uh, uh, my understanding is we're three years behind adoption on, on the site. Three. Right. Well, there's three years. Actually, um, yeah, three years left in this planning cycle. And, and then we start over again. Yes, actually, we will be back to you within two years right. with an okay. update. So within two years, you'll be back with us, and we'll be starting the process of identifying sites again. That is, that is correct. And we're, we're fairly behind on this because we, we voted for this once, submitted it, and it's come back to us because it was thrown Correct. Right. Plus, we did it. We prepared an EIR to actually rezone the sites rather than wait um, for a year, we could have we could have moved the housing element first, and then come back later. But we felt that it all to meet the to truly meet the requirements of the California Environmental Quality Act, they all needed to be done as a package. Mm -hmm. So I, I would just offer, in in the interest of trying to get something done, um, the, the idea of, of of going with staff's recommendation increases our chances of getting something done because. We have willing sellers, as Supervisor, uh, as Supervisor Long uh, pointed out, and this doesn't mean these other sites aren't going to surface again in two years as, as we start to move forward. Um, but we have been held up um, with this process uh, uh, quite a bit as, as, as we move forward. So, uh, and I guess the other thing I just want to emphasize is part of what I'm thinking this through is this board actually voted for this plan once and so we need to have a compelling reason if we voted for this once we submitted it I, I feel like we have to have a compelling reason to change from what we voted for before the, the only question I was asking if we submit all eight Zaragoza? excuse me I'm sorry ma'am okay. you know, um, are we are still okay with the you know, we submit all eight or is that not feasible or, 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 or not recommended or, or why well, staff did not recommend all eight sites for the reason I said. However, your board yeah. uh, has yeah. all the information available that you could make a decision to rezone all eight sites today. Okay. Okay. And uh, Supervisor uh, Foy has another comment. Let me just ask another question. Um, some of these sites that you have are near high density anyway, right? Some of the sites were close to housing, Somewhere. and some are. Somewhat. But I'm yeah. also then looking at some of the other sites yeah. that are just without near anything. So they changed the whole community by doing that. Is there a reason why, if you're going to extend 25, 30 units, like some of these are farmland in the middle of nowhere, even the Santa Susana, you know, it's not high density, and all of a sudden we're going to put high density right into a community that doesn't have that? Well, I would actually go so far to say is that most of them do not currently have high density around them because this is a new zone. This isn't Well, I understand, but I'm just saying with, 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 within, a, within a few yeah. block, a block or two, do they get units? They've got a lot where some of these don't have anything at all. It just seems like it changes that whole community. And then the other side is, I don't think we're trying to take too much farmland, hopefully, to do this, right? I know it's a hard position. Yeah. Your, your whole job is to find some place to put houses. Where it might yeah. work somewhere. I know. <laughs> And, and you raise a good point. Uh, the county unincorporated area has no high density zone, period. And uh, it's for a reason because our county has deliberately made a point of saying build urban development in the cities. And so this is a tremendous departure from our county's guidelines for early development, even. So uh, that, that is uh, of concern, I think. 
And, and that is also leads to the difficulty that we have had, I think, to date in, in meeting this. And I personally think the state requirement that you must have this and it must be by right, so you can't even have a public hearing and, and people's input to help adjust it, to me is really uh, the state going out, you know, put, putting a lot on, the, on our county particularly because the county of Ventura is different than other counties, and it's not just because we're here and think it's special. It's because we have a development process that says you build in the cities. It may work in, uh, in a lot of the other counties where you have already high-density development, but we don't have it in Ventura County, so it does make it difficult. And our, I think our, our first uh, important thing to do as a board is to make sure that we protect public health and safety, number one. It's great we need to get affordable housing, but we can't do it if we're going to compromise the public health and safety on some of these issues. And then secondly, we want to make sure that we can look and get it as compatible as we can in making sure that we can provide a safe environment for the, the housing that we're going to place on it. Unless, just, yes, just one, just one more, one more minute. Uh, what I was saying also is that we need affordable housing where the jobs, are, the jobs are, to keep uh, employees for, to have to travel from one side of the county to the other. So I think that's an important element too. And, and also to have housing where if you're going to have children, there's a place where they can walk on a sidewalk or, you know, that they're, they're going to be safe. So that there's a lot of things that we need to balance. But I think public health and safety has to be a top one. I, I have cards from lots of speakers. Um, we actually have oh, another okay. component that, to go right. over. Okay. So we I just wanted to those. capture that these while are, we were these there. Are just, these are just the, the sites that we're talking about. Now so we I'm going to let Shelly continue since she's been the lead on this part of the program. You Thank just you. have your d'oeuvres. <laughs> <laughs> You're the main course, are you? Well, not to be devoured, I hope. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to play the glasses game because nothing really works. Good afternoon, members of the board. As Kari mentioned, my name is Shelley Sussman, and I will be walking you through the project elements known as Component B that are listed here. They include farm worker housing complexes, larger second dwelling units, adding emergency shelters as a use within the CPD zone, and adding reasonable accommodation provisions for people with disabilities in our zoning ordinances. So jumping into farm worker housing complexes, they are currently an allowed use in the county. They're allowed on uh, parcels in the AE and open space zones, and they currently require a minimum of 40 acres. They require a discretionary plan development permit, which is approved by the Planning Commission. And what we're proposing to do is to allow a landowner to carve out a smaller piece of their, of their parcel for the purposes of building farm worker housing. <coughs> And we're proposing to allow the development of such a substandard parcel in the AE zone only. And we're not proposing to change the type of permit that's required for that development. And this project component also requires a minor revision to the subdivision ordinance to allow for those exceptions to minimum parcel size. And that subdivision ordinance update is part of your packet. Exhibit whatever. <laughs> We also identified other criteria that we thought were important for these housing complexes. And with input from the agricultural community in 2009, when we brought the housing element to your board, uh, it was determined that the parcels should be a minimum of 15 acres. And that would allow for the remainder non-housing portion of the parcel to be a minimum of 10 acres, with the thought that that would allow for um, viable agricultural activities to remain on that parcel. We thought it was important that they be within or adjacent to a city sphere to allow for access to services, all the things that you have discussed so far this afternoon, and that the parcels not be in the coastal zone or owned by a public entity. And there are 185 parcels that meet those criteria, and they're scattered around, as depicted by the blue dots. 
We did analyze the farm worker housing complex program in our supplemental environmental impact report. And we don't know which of the 185 parcels will be developed for this purpose. Therefore, any of the impacts listed here are speculative. However, there were four potential impacts identified, significant unmitigated impacts. And they include potential loss of agricultural soils classified as prime or statewide in the important farmland inventory. And then these public service and facilities issues that Kari mentioned in, in her slides relating to RHD, impacts on libraries, pedestrian access, and so on. Moving on to second dwelling units. Again, these uses are currently allowed in the county. Uh, there are currently a 1,200 square foot maximum dwelling unit size specified in zones that allow second dwelling units. And we currently don't allow second dwelling units on non-conforming parcels between 10,000 and 20,000 square feet, and they require a zoning clearance and ministerial approval. And what we're proposing to do is to allow second dwelling units of up to 1,800 square feet on parcels of at least 40 acres, and this would allow us to accommodate uh, a second dwelling that has four bedrooms, and this would help us to address the housing need for larger low-income families. Uh, large families are considered a special needs group in housing element law, and this is one program designed to try to meet the needs of those larger families. We're also proposing to allow second dwellings of up to 1,200 square feet on those non-conforming parcels uh, so that we would treat them consistently with the way we treat conforming parcels of the same size. And we're not proposing any modifications to the ministerial approval process. And these parcels, there are about 1,800 of them. They're scattered all over. And I, I don't have a map of those because they're just spread all over the county. We looked at this program also as part of our environmental review. But because 1,200 square foot units are already allowed, the EIR focused only on the potential impacts associated with that additional 600 square feet associated with those larger units. And as with farm worker complexes, we don't know where these larger units will be built, so the impacts are, are speculative. However, again, there were some uh, significant unmitigated impacts identified. They're listed here. Unlike farm worker complexes, however, which will still require a PD permit, these will be ministerial. And so these um, impacts would not necessarily be identified or, or mitigated. But the same is true of existing second dwelling units of 1,200 square feet. OK, on to emergency shelter. Emergency shelters are included in our project because the state requires that our housing element include them. The state recognized that homelessness is a big issue, and in their words, a continuing and growing crisis. And as a result, the state passed the emergency shelter law known as SB2, and it required effective January 1st of 2008 that all jurisdictions, if they didn't already have enough capacity to meet their need, all jurisdictions had to identify at least one zone where an emergency shelter could be built by right, similar to the RHD discussion that, that Kari presented, and by right is without a CUP or other discretionary entitlement. I've included the state definition of emergency shelter here just so we all know what we're talking about. It's housing with minimal support services for homeless persons limited to an occupancy of six months in any given year and no individual can be denied because of an inability to pay. Now, our proposed definition includes a little bit of flexibility to accommodate victims of domestic violence and people who are temporarily made homeless due to natural disaster. So we've broadened the definition somewhat while wholly including the state's definition. The state law requires that a shelter must accommodate a year-round need, and I'll get to the question of need in a moment with the next slide. The law also allows 
for that need to be accommodated through agreements with adjacent cities and in early program development we initiated those discussions with the cities of Ventura and Oxnard through the CEO's office but those discussions really remained preliminary and the county made the decision at that point to go the route of identifying a zone in the county where a shelter could be built uh, because we wanted to make sure that we could comply with state law on this matter so on to the question of need it really translates into the question how many homeless people are there in the unincorporated area and the source for that information for us is uh, gathered every year uh, through the Ventura County Homeless and Housing Coalition's annual homeless count this table represents data from the last three years 2009 10 and 11 the second column is the number of homeless people counted on that one night anywhere in the county the numbers range from roughly 1900 to 2200 and then that third column is the number of people counted somewhere in the unincorporated area on the night of the count and the percentage there is the percentage of the total number counted the percentage of um, people in the unincorporated area as a as a percentage of the total and you can see that that percentage has remained fairly constant for those three years I've also included the number of children in the homeless count from this last year 2011 um, this 220 children represents 10 percent of the total number of homeless people counted Madam Chair. Shelley, is that uh, the 220 children? Is that because of the economy or people losing their homes or do you know? That would be my guess. We have Carol Shulkin here who is the expert mm -hmm. on all, all things homeless in the county. That's a, that's a lot of children, 220 children. Yeah, I mean, um, I think everybody would assume yes. that the economy and um, people losing their homes people losing and homes and living on the edge it doesn't mm -hmm. take much for families to cross over that line into homelessness and that um, nine percent increase just uh, in last year alone then. right nine percent increase in homeless families a pretty notable increase mm -hmm. so that's our need uh, 209 is formally the need that we are looking at um, we're required to address we're required to plan for so when we talk about what is the homeless need that is the need 209 and you can see uh, it doesn't range too much 200 to 250 roughly so how are we proposing to comply with the law uh, first I think it's instructive to clarify what we are not proposing because there has been a lot of confusion in the community over these last couple months as this program has um, been discussed in the uh, amongst community members so I want to be very clear we are not proposing a zone change where we meaning the county <laughs> we are not going to condemn anybody's property to build a shelter and we are not going to force a property owner to build a shelter if they don't want to what we are proposing to do is add an additional use to an existing zone so the question then is what zone we looked at the ag open space and residential zones and as you know much of that area is very rural and typically not close enough to public services to make it a viable option for homeless people similarly with the industrial zones there are three of them uh, they're unlike industrial zones in cities which tend to be closer to uh, city centers or other urban services ours are typically very rural and far away from transportation and and city centers and again zones not intended for dwellings and we looked at the commercial zones and there are three of them there's commercial office which is that CO commercial retail and the commercial plan development zone and what emerged from the evaluation of the commercial zones was that the CPD what the CPD zone was the only zone that allowed all three of these uses 
Um, hotels, motels, and boarding houses certainly present similar land use considerations to emergency shelter. And in fact, emergency shelter type uses are already allowed in the CPD zone with a discretionary permit. And finally, importantly, uh, when we took the housing element to the board in 2009, we were instructed to evaluate the CPD zone for this purpose. Excuse me. In addition to the identification of the appropriate zone, there are other important criteria. Staff thought it was important that the parcels be located within a city sphere. And in 2009, the board further re refined that criteria and specified that it should be a city with a population of a minimum of 20,000 people, again, to allow for better access to services. That's definitely a theme you're hearing here. It needed to be on a sewer line, existing or expected future sewer line, and that was an EHD requirement. And we wanted a, a parcel of a decent size to allow for a reasonable size shelter. Um, staff also specified after receiving comments uh, from the Rio School District during the SEIR process that parcels used for shelter should be a minimum of 300 feet from schools. And the school district uh, thought this was an acceptable distance, and that was the only school district we heard from during the uh, EIR process. The law also allows jurisdictions to specify that shelters not be more than 300 feet apart from one another. So, for example, we couldn't require that shelters be 500 or 1,000 feet from one another. And so we added that 300-foot distance. Could you, could you say that again, the whole thing? Okay. Um, the law allows jurisdictions to specify that shelters not be more than 300 feet from one another. But we're not allowed to say more than 300 feet. Right. We, we couldn't say they have to be at least 1,000. 1,000. It's just illegal for us to do that. That is correct. Right. So we did apply that 300-foot limit in our ordinance, our proposed ordinance, in our development standard. So applying all of those criteria that I just described yields 12 sites that, that meet all of those criteria on the list, but only eight of them could be used as shelter due to those 300-foot distance limits. And uh, here's where they fall out, Montalvo, Strickland, El Rio, and Nylon, and I'll go through maps of all of them with the right glasses. Um, they're all color-coded very similarly, so you'll be able to sort of jump to the uh, features on, on each successive map. Uh, the CPD parcels on, in each area are in this orange. So here we are in Montalvo. Here's the 101 freeway. Here's Victoria. This is the Victoria Motel. And this is the strip mall that has the post office and uh, a bar and a dog grooming place. And um, in this purple line represents a bus route, and we thought that was an important feature to uh, highlight. And then all of the parcels that are outlined in blue are schools that are nearby. So you can see on this map, this uh, is 331 feet. These two, these two CPD parcels, so they both remain on our list, uh, or they meet the criteria, um, and they are approximately 1,000 feet from the Montalvo Elementary School. Here are the sites in Strickland. Again, the two orange. Before you, before you go on, okay. I just want to be clear. Yes. Um, now, Unlike what we just went through with the uh, low-income housing, where we were looking for willing property owners, here these sites would only develop if the property owner wanted to do correct. this. This and is not the county saying the property owner must do this that or is correct. should do this or anything else. Right. But it's it allows adding, it to happen only if the property owner wanted to do it. Right. It's adding a use to the right. CPD zone. And at this point in time, staff... Staff has contacted these, pro these property owners. The property owners have contacted us, and so. Bruce Smith can speak to that directly. Uh, he spoke with both of them and expressed that, the property owners expressed to him that they were not interested at all in, in doing this. In doing this. Right. 
Thank you. Bruce, do you want to add any more insight into that? Okay. That's correct. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> okay, so back to Strickland. Again, the CPD parcels, I keep pressing the wrong button, are here in orange, and because they're closer than 300 feet, uh, only one of them would be considered, um, you know, we would only, only one of them could be developed as a shelter. This is um, a notation here that there is a bus stop within a half a mile from this location. This is central, I'm sorry, this is site five that Kari uh, introduced to you. Here's Rio Mesa High School. Here is a private school, and you can see that the sites are well in excess of the 300 feet limit. Madam Chair, in the Strickland, the, uh, did they agree in Strickland? Or you, uh, the uh, we were not contacted by them, and again, because it's, it's not anything we're going to impose, we okay. didn't pull them to see if they're interested. Because they even want the housing element to start off with, you know, now. There was right. No One of the sites is the Red Wing Shoe Store. Then in the corner. Yeah. And then this side, I believe, is vacant. Mm -hmm. It's graded. It's been graded and disturbed, but it's, it's vacant. Okay. I think it has a tank on it. Oh, did I skip? No. Okay. Uh, there's two slides for El Rio. This is the first one, and there are several CPD parcels um, on this slide. Oh, God, I'm so sorry. This is uh, Vineyard. Here's River Park. And um, only, yeah, it's right here. Here's the Rio Vista Middle School, and here's Rio Del Mar Elementary School. Here's Vineyard. Here's the whole development right back in here and over here. Um, these two sites, only one of those would be developed. And similarly up here, only one of those would be developed, but they do exceed the 300-foot uh, distance to schools. And these sites here with the X's through them, uh, these were sites that were evaluated as part of the environmental impact report, but they were eliminated because, or they didn't meet the criteria because they uh, are closer than 300 feet to the schools across the street. Madam Chair, are they on the commercial side or the residential side? Residential side. Okay. Okay. Here are the other two uh, CPD parcels in El Rio. Here's the 101 freeway. Here is uh, Ventura Boulevard and Vineyard, the bus route again. Uh, this is El Rio Elementary School, which for the last several years has not actually been used as a school, but the Rio School District didn't know what their future long-range plans were for the school, and so we um, took this site out of the mix because it was closer than 300 feet to the school, even though there's, it's not being used as a school. But this site remains on the list of sites that meet the criteria. And finally, Nyland Acres. Uh, for context, here's the 101 freeway, Ventura Boulevard, Santa Clara, and there's a lot of construction on the interchange happening in this area. Um, only one of these two sites could be used, and this site remains on the list. And then these sites were evaluated as part of the EIR uh, because we wanted to make sure we had an ample pool of available sites that met our criteria, but they're just under a half an acre. They're 0.49 acres. But we thought as long as we're doing this, it would be prudent to include more sites than fewer sites. You have the option of looking at them as um, merged sites? Uh, I don't know, I suppose. I mean, they're all owned. I think one of them, two of the parcels that are adjacent to each other are owned by the same property owner. The property owner could merge them. Yeah. But that would be their if they're choice. excluded because they're too small, you have that option. But, shall, but those are only recommended sites. That doesn't mean it's... Well, they were sites that met the initial... The criteria. They, they met all the criteria, except they were just a smidgen under a half an acre. Isn't that site in the city of Oxnard? Is that right on Ventura Boulevard? That one? Yeah, none of those sites are in the city of Oxnard. Because okay, I know there's some property... They're, that, they're just adjacent, you can adjacent see. Adjacent to the city. Yeah, you can see the highlighted part right here. 
Yeah, okay. Comes right up against them. Again, we're not recommending any particular site. Yes, we're just simply applying the criteria and informing you what sites what might be eligible. Available, but, but not recommending them. Yeah. Okay. Again, as I mentioned, we did include emergency shelters as part of our environmental review, and there were some significant unmitigated impacts identified, uh, temporary construction noise, and again, these infrastructure issues that keep popping up, public services. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I would just want to briefly discuss some of the ordinance provisions for shelters. Again, state law requires that they be ministerial. And we've also, as uh, Kari described with the RHD ordinance, we've proposed a deposit for processing an emergency shelter zoning clearance of $600, which I believe is four hours worth of time and would be adjusted up or down depending on how long it actually took to um, issue the zoning clearance. And the ordinance requires that um, we look at development standards, construction and operational standards, and that emergency shelters operate in compliance with what we call an emergency shelter management plan. And I'll get to the management plan in a second, but development standards includes, thing, includes things like the distance between shelters that I talked about, a minimum amount of living space per resident, uh, issues of water availability, which you've heard already, and the requirement to comply with all applicable building codes and standards. Construction and operational standards includes things like pave-out policies and uh, kitchen facilities have to meet a certain standard if they're going to be included in a shelter site. And importantly, we included uh, a provision for intake and release times for shelter residents and specified that they can't coincide with the start and release time of any school that's within a half a mile from the shelter. Unless, of course, the shelter resident is one of those 220 children, in which case they would be released from the shelter and make their way to school. Uh, we specify that no more than 60 residents can be housed in the shelter at any one time. And that limit was set after consulting with Carol Shulkin again, the famous Carol Shulkin, um, who specified that she, she believed that that was the upper limit of, of um, the number of residents that could be accommodated. And again, we also require a shelter management plan, and I'll discuss that in more detail. The management plan is definitely an important feature of the ordinance, and all of the issues listed here must be adequately addressed in the management plan. Uh, in the ordinance, we specify that the CEO has responsibility for determining whether the management plan meets these requirements, and in doing so, they must consult with the sheriff's department, the police departments of the adjacent cities, uh, any affected school districts and county agencies of various stripes. We also... So it's, it's, it's at that point in time issues of security would, would yes. be, have to be addressed in yes. the CEO's office yes. satisfaction. Okay. Yes. And in fact, occupancy screening is one of the things I'm going to highlight. Um, the occupancy screening is an important issue, and we heard about it at the Planning Commission hearing, um, and it will assure that only those people who can legally reside there do so. So I've noted Jessica's law because we heard about it again at the Planning Commission hearing, and Jessica's law basically prohibits sex offenders from living within 2,000 feet of any school or park. So using this occupancy screening requirement, obviously a sex offender would not be allowed to reside in the shelter if it was within that 2,000 foot limit. And again, I think consultation with the Sheriff's Department and local police departments would be important in, in this regard. So moving on to reasonable accommodation. We're proposing to modify both the coastal and non-coastal zoning ordinances to comply with required reasonable accommodation provisions, and they're required by state and federal law, and they're intended to provide people with disabilities reasonable accommodation in land use um, and zoning rules. 
And our ordinance describes a process for submitting an application and getting it reviewed and evaluated and approved. And we've also included an appeals process. And requests are approved or denied by the planning director, but they can be appealed to the planning commission. We've also added some state definitions of um, certain, types, oh, certain types of housing uh, based on input from HCD, as Kari mentioned early on. Uh, we added definitions for single room occupancy, supportive housing, and transitional housing. And we've clarified where in the uh, ordinance code those housing units are allowed. So that brings us to the summary of staff's recommendations for the entire project. The recommendations are listed here and cover all of the various project components that we've presented this afternoon. They include approval of the general plan amendments to the goals, policies, and programs, land use resources, and hazards appendix, uh, approval of the RHD uh, rezoning sites, approval of adding emergency shelters as a use in the CPD zone, non-coastal zoning ordinance amendments related to second dwelling units and farm worker complexes, reasonable accommodation amendments uh, for both non-coastal and coastal, and then the minor change to the subdivision ordinance. And there are five slides following this that contain 16 formal recommendations, and uh, Roberta informs us that we will all be spared a reading of those. Um, they're all included in your packet, and uh, that concludes our presentation, and we're available for questions. Thank you. Does the board have any questions on this portion? Okay. Oh. Thank you. Could, could we take just a very quick two-minute break um, before we start into 20 that speakers? That probably work. sure. Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay. We'll take a quick two-minute break.
Okay, we're going to come back into our session after our, our brief uh, little recess. We have um, enough cards to fill a good hour worth of testimony. And I encourage you, if uh, perhaps the person in front of you or someone before you has already said what you wanted to say, you could point that out and not say it over again so we don't we can go a little faster if you don't want to repeat um, that that's where we're at too our first uh, speaker on this is Lori Curtis Abbey and uh, regarding the Montalvo rezoning followed by Thor Molman and then Marilyn Erkuleski which I'm sure I pronounced incorrectly no that was perfect that was good? Oh. A little bit of a twang. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak before you. My name is Lori Curtis Abbey. I live in Montavo. I am an eighth grade U.S. History, Language Arts, and Gate teacher at Anacapa Middle School. So I live in Montavo and I live with the kids that come from Montavo Elementary and go to Anacapa. Uh, a letter is being passed to you that I composed concerning opposing the proposal of putting a shelter in Montalvo and as I heard from Ms. Sessman the property owners are not willing to sell but I am concerned about other property options that may come up um, in being that they are commercial options later on so I have a request, and forgive me, is it possible to use your map of Montavo when I refer to a few areas? Okay, we'll see and if we can get the map of Montavo up on this screen while you're is talking. That, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Why don't you pass out my paper ones right now? Like and oh, by the way, I didn't mention we're going to get it, keep it to three minutes. So um, that is uh, how much each three individual minutes. has okay. to speak. Three minutes. Okay. I'll hustle. Yes. Uh, members of the the board, regarding your dis your pending decision today on whether or not to submit to the state of California unincorporated Montavos two commercial zones for approval as homeless shelter properties, I am adamantly against it. As a 16-year Montavo homeowner and resident, I question the board's interest in trying to improve the quality of living in Montavo by zoning the two properties for homeless shelters or merely getting a monkey off their back, meaning Sacramento, at the expense of Montavo's families, school children, and its local businesses. I believe it is the latter. As the Ventura County Star stated when reporting on the Ventura County Planning Commission's June 3rd meeting concerning Montavo, Commissioners said they weren't crazy about some proposals, but they felt hemmed in by state law that includes harsh penalties for cities and counties that neglect their housing elements. The right rezoning of properties for higher densities was necessary so that the county can meet state requirements for the number of residential units. Its zoning allows to be built by 2014. There aren't any of these uses that belong in the unincorporated areas as far as I'm concerned not the housing density, nor the, not the emergency shelters, but the state mandates it. Commissioner Onstott said, I believe the negative consequences far outweigh the need to placate the state's demands, and now the commission's four to one, in my opinion, cavalier approval of a Montalvo homeless emergency, emergency shelter. The consequences for rezoning either or both of the proposed Montalvo's commercial partial, parcels as homeless emergency shelters are these. Transients walking through the Montalvo neighborhoods during the day and possibly during the night, a safety threat to Montalvo's residents and families and their property. Possible increased drug and violent crime activity in an already struggling small community where drugs, crime, and gang violence can be a challenge for the Ventura Police and Sheriff's Departments. For example, two robberies and shootings were at the Log Cabin Liquor on Alameda Street and... I'm new to this. Can you tell me which to push? The, you want the, the little red thing? The, the little laser, yes. That red dot. The laser. Okay, here we go. Um, let's see. This is Grand Avenue. We've got Bristol Road. Uh, Alameda is down here, and you've got Log Cabin Liquor right in here. So we've got a, a robbery and shooting. Uh, and I've given you the dates. November 27, 22nd in 2007 and February 28, 2010. Two robberies and shootings at 7-Eleven convenience store just last year. Oops. 
Oh dear, forgive me. Go back. Yay. <laughs> You'd think a teacher would know how to do this. Uh, Bristol Road is over here and 7 Eleven's right over here, and uh, two uh, store clerks were shot on two different occasions, injured quite badly. Gang related shooting outside the apartments at the corner of Peacock and Hummingbird Streets on October 23rd just last year. And again, we've got those apartments just over here off to the side. Since Montalvo's Ventura Police Department storefront left, it's Bristol Road, and uh, that storefront is right over here. Uh, location a few years ago, violent crimes and drug activity and gang activity have increased in the Montalvo area, especially within the area of the apartments by the Metrolink Depot, which is down here uh, near Nightingale, right here. Heightened safety concerns for the elementary, middle school, and high school age students that walk to and from their bus stops, often accompanied by adults, and to Montalvo Elementary School Monday through Friday during the school year. The loss of business, Mike's Fiesta Restaurant is right here, and that's where the Victorian Motel is located. It's a welcoming cheers-like diner, and by the way, if you've never been there, you got to go visit the Omar family. They uh, know your name, just like Cheers, and they treat you like family. It's a well-established restaurant patronized regularly by Montavo and Ventura's residents, many of whom are weekly and daily regulars. By zoning the Victorian Motel and Mike's Fiesta Restaurant for a homeless shelter, the Omar family be forced to go out of business and therefore lose their livelihood, and we would lose a treasured gathering place. Could you please wrap up your time? Of course, time? absolutely. Um, I talk in the letter about property values. Um, I also mention that I located on Google two on other unincorporated sites um, that you could look at and um, I am asking that you consider the safety of our neighborhood um, not just the kids but the families um, I ask that you consider what do we already have going with the loss of the Ventura PD and the Sheriff's Department would you be compromising more of our safety and um, hindering improvement in the, the area of Montalvo. Thank, thank you, you for your time. I'm grateful. Thank you, and thank you for submitting it in writing also. And thank you for all those years teaching those eighth graders. And our next speaker also with children is Thor Molman, followed by Marilyn Erklowiski, and then John Wanamaker. Hello, my name is Thor Moman. I live at 2377 Grand Avenue in the Montalvo area. It's the old uh, Linda's Little Buddies Preschool right on the corner of Graham and Seahawk. I was born and raised in Ventura, and I've lived in Montalvo for almost 12 years. Um, I'm here because I'm very concerned about this homeless shelter or the emergency shelter coming to an area. I know we're all NIMBYs when it comes to things like a methadone clinic or a homeless shelter and the stigma that comes with that. But in this particular instance, I'm very concerned because the, the public's perception, I think, of this homeless catastrophe or crisis is grossly, grossly overweight. Uh, I've been working with the homeless for 13 years. I'm a veteran. In my 13 years, I, I'm, maybe I want to throw up when I hear this. Veterans, veterans. I've met two veterans in 13 years that, that are homeless. There are so many social programs out there. And why I applaud the, the staff's effort, um, on this study, it's grossly flawed because it takes a lot of things not into consideration, like they did a homeless count on one night somewhere in Ventura. Well, how do I know this was done in Montalvo? How do I not know it was done in North Ventura Avenue? And how do I know it was not done on one of the nights where they do the mass exodus in the jails, where the homeless want to get to one of the railroad trestles and travel throughout the county? How do, I, how do I know it was not done on one of those three or four nights? There's a lot of ambiguity, a lot of value-added words like occupancy screening, what does that mean? We know in an emergency, what screening is there in an emergency? Um, these are probably going to be operated through grants, so they want to get people in there. And if you don't allow them in, they're going to be parked next to my house. And let me tell you a little, what did we have the other day? What happened on the grass? There was a man pooping and peeing while reading a newspaper. On the grass. Hmm. Now... This isn't something that I know we have a, maybe a little crisis here in Mentor. We have a lot of panhandlers, but I think this is putting this in this particular area when you have other areas like North Winter Avenue, which might have been discussed before, which has, has buses, is not near any schools, even has two libraries in downtown Ventura. And this, the cutoff, as I understand it, is Stanley and uh, the North Winter Avenue area is county. The south part of the river bottom is controlled by the city. 
Um, why was that area not considered? Uh, I, I'm not sure why. And why to put this in, in an area that is probably in the next 10 years, probably within my lifetime, my children's lifetime, going to be incorporated into the city. Additionally, uh, Senate Bill 2, um, it says that they may contract with other agencies. Um, they said that the talks may have fallen apart with other agencies. Why did these talks fall apart? Why are we not? Con why is this not being contracted with Turning Point Foundation, with uh, Salvation Army, with the Coalition for Child and Ab Abuse and Neglect? Why are we not? Why has there been no discussions with them over putting this in another location that is more, um, you know, not in an actual neighborhood and so close to a school? And then the other thing that Senate Bill Two addresses is. It's required only if there is a need. And then let me say this, 55% of statistics are made up on the spot. I just made that up. I think a lot of these statistics are just made up. Show me the proof. Show me a video. Show me pictures. Show me something tangible that I can say we have these 200 homeless children. Maybe there are homeless children. I haven't seen any in 13 years in public service. There probably are some out there, but 200 of them in this area? I highly doubt that. I mean, and, and like uh, um, Supervisor Saragosa asked before, um, yes, this is something probably due to the housing crisis, due to the, due to the downturn of economy, but let's see some tangible evidence of this. And then finally, Jessica's law. Um, we, as I said before, we, they're saying, talking about occupancy screening. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. It doesn't happen at other shelters. It doesn't happen at coalition. It doesn't happen at the, at the Salvation Army, excuse me, at the, uh, uh, yeah, the Salvation Army in downtown Ventura. Screening doesn't happen at these places. They want to get people in there, and they're trying to do good things. Um, and finally, um, oh, one other thing I mentioned is they said that they consult the staff said that they consulted the school district. Who at the school district was consulted? I spoke personally with Principal Michelle Dean, who's the um, principal at Montavo Elementary School. She said she heard about it, but was never consulted and was never asked. How do we know that this didn't land up on someone, someone's desk, a janitor's desk, and it went nowhere? Who was contacted? What did they say? Because no one appears to be contact, been contacted at Montalvo Elementary School. So I'm very much against this um, being put in this particular area, and I urge the, the county supervisors to maybe send them back to the drawing board and look at other areas, in particular North Ventura Avenue where there's no schools nearby. There are buses, there are libraries, there are social services, and many of these individuals are already in that area. So I want to thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And I just want your daughter to know what you saw was not right, and we don't, you will never see that again. I promise you. Our next speaker then is Marilyn Erkowski, followed by John Wanamaker, and then Jim Hupp. Good afternoon, board members. I have copies here if you want to pass these out. Somebody want to take these? Do you want to pass these out, please? Hi there, my name is Marilyn Erkliewski, so you're very close. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm just going to read a letter that I briefly typed up, um, and I just wanted everyone to know that as a, as a real estate professional, um, real estate agent and a resident of the area, I oppose the amended zone edition as well. I was corporate trained with Century 21 several years ago and was told um, in order to be a successful agent that one needed to farm and to be active in a particular area in which I chose the Montava Whirl and Montava Heights track. For several years now I have a walk uh, these tracks to pass out my yearly calendars and to wish the residents a Merry Christmas. As, as time has gone by I have seen the elderly and the long-term residents pass on with the incoming of young professional families with children taking up home ownership with pride, remodeling and upgrading their homes. By adding the particular selected sites in the Montalvo uh, area to the CPD zoning for an emergency shelter, I feel this may be a poor choice as the area is upcoming with families, with children, and I am concerned the integrity of the neighborhood would decline for various reasons that have been voiced in the planning commission meeting in early June. I'm also concerned who will be responsible for patrolling the area regarding the police force as there are many problems and confusions now regarding which, uh, which uh, 
who should handle current problems. There have been several times when I have phoned as a citizen and have been passed back and forth between the city police and the county sheriff's office with no results nor any protection. I believe there should be an emergency shelter available to those in need. However, I'm not sure if these particular sites selected should be so close to residential areas, convenience stores, liquor stores, bars, schools. This project may be federally funded in which the county may need to make some quick decisions, but I request that you rec uh, reconsider the matter for this particular area. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. John Wanamaker, followed by Jim Hupp, and then Holly Hagee, or Hagee. Thank you. I'll put his card aside. Mr. Good afternoon, Wanamaker. panel. I'm John Wanamaker. It seems like I just moved to Montalvo, but it's been 52 years already. <laughs> uh, it seems like we're the... I had a note here. Charlie Brown, why are you always picking on Montelvo? I moved in. They took our water tank away from us. They took our school away from us. LAFCO, Dog and Pony Show, came through twice, tried to take us over. Just please leave us alone. We don't need a homeless shelter down there. They're too nice a neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you for your concise and remarks. Holly Hagee, followed by Elvia Vasquez, and then Marie Mason. Good afternoon. My name is Holly Hagee, and I live on Catherine Avenue. Um, some of the previous speakers have voiced some of my concerns, so I'm going to try to skip over those as much as possible. I may repeat slightly, and I'm a little nervous, so please bear with me. Thank you. Um, I am adamantly opposed to changing the zoning for a homeless shelter in my neighborhood of Montalvo. I bought my home uh, just a little over seven months ago, and had I known um, buying my home in that area had there been a, that there would be a possible homeless shelter there, I wouldn't have bought in that neighborhood. I worked for over 20 years, long and hard, in the entertainment industry to be able to afford to buy my first house in California, and I'm very, very proud of it, and I love my little neighborhood and community. It's a great neighborhood with... Um, Hard-working people, professional families, and retirees, we all take very good care of our homes, and we have a real pride of ownership. We're real neighbors with relationships with one another, next door, down the street, and several streets over. We have a post office that I use at least twice a week. We have a dog groomers that my doggies use. Uh, we go to Mike's restaurant. We have a nice motel that our relatives stay at during the holidays. And we have a convenience store that we use for those late-night ice cream runs. We feel safe being able to do all of that. I would not feel safe being able to do all of that with a homeless shelter in my neighborhood. The safety of our neighborhood and our homes and our children and future children would be greatly compromised by allowing a homeless shelter. They referred to Jessica's law, and I was going to go into detail about that, but it's already been done, so I won't. But I do want to mention that even if there is screening at the homeless shelter, that would not prevent people, uh, registered sex offenders, from coming to the homeless shelter, trying to get admitted, or hanging out at the homeless shelter or around the homeless shelter after being denied entry, or hanging out with their friends that were admitted, and then them waiting for them to be released. I also find it odd that when the county is struggling with meeting their budgets that they would be willing to take a well-established neighborhood and change or adapt the zoning change for a homeless shelter which would then decrease our property values just when the county needs the property tax revenue the most. I don't really want to pay more in property taxes, but I do want the value of my home and therefore the value of my property tax to increase. Um, the county planner said that they had a plan to cover all these concerns, but as I've mentioned a little bit before, some of them aren't really addressed. Um, changing the release hours of the shelters will not keep the homeless away from our school and from our children, and as I mentioned, hanging out in our neighborhood. Um, I'm not trying to say the homeless shouldn't be helped, the homeless should be helped, but we need to find a viable, proper way to help them, and I don't think that putting or changing the zoning would do that in our neighborhood. One second, bear with me, please. Um, I think that there are other parcels in the county that could be considered or studied. My understanding is that some other parcels were suggested, but because 
People didn't have the parcel numbers with them that they were dismissed. This might be a better fit in the long run for Ventura, and I think that we should take the time and the effort and the money to find the best fit for the county of Ventura. I know that there needs to be a quick fix. Okay, I'll wrap it up. Um, to uh, avoid not being penalized by the state, but we have to do it right. I ask that you please vote against this for the sake of our children, for the sake of my neighborhood, and for the sake of Ventura County. Let's keep it the best possible county in California. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Higgy. Elvia Vasquez, followed by Marie Mason, and then Don Kowalski. Hi, I'm going to be translating her t testimony. If can we have a little bit more time? Yes. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Um, vengo del área del río. Tengo tres hijos. Uno de trece, el ocho de, de ocho y cuatro. En total somos cinco en la familia. So hi, I come from the area of the Rio. Um, I have three children of ages thirteen, eight, and four. In total, we're five in the family. Somos trabajadores del campo agrícola. Represento también a la organización MICAP. We are workers, um, we are field workers from agriculture. And I, hear, I come here to represent, um, you could go, I could go with that. Agricola, campo agrícola. Yeah. Uh, our workers from the field. Y represento a MICAP. And I represent MICAP. Vine a dar mi testimonio el porqué de nuestras necesidades de casas de bajos recursos. I come here to give my testimony of, of the need of um, affordable housing for agriculture workers. El salario es el mínimo. No podemos pagar una casa de dos o tres recámaras porque las rentas están muy altas, arriba de dos mil dólares. We work for the uh, minimum jobs. The uh, rent... Oh, it's so affordable to afford a house of two or three bedrooms, and the rents could be from 2,000 when we're winning a minimum job or wage. Una sola persona en la familia gana 80 dólares al día. Okay. A one a family member could win 80 dollars a day. Uh, that's depending on 10 hours of work. Y una de las condiciones de rentar un solo cuarto es este, que nos imponen también horarios de usar la cocina. Tenemos solamente una hora para hacer el lonche en la mañana y una hora para darle, darles de cenar a nuestros hijos en la noche. It's, when a person is renting one room, there are certain conditions when uh, renting a room within uh, various families. As she was saying, one of the conditions they apply is only give them an hour to do your lunch or an, and an hour later on to give your dinner to your family and children. And por eso vine a, a exponer nuestras necesidades y esto lo pasa más la comunidad mixteca que tienen que juntarse como cuatro este, familias en la casa para poder rentar una sola casa. Is, those are the kind of conditions a family can face but it's not just one family and all. In the, in the house of three rooms, uh, there could be four families living there. And this is a family of, as you said, Mixteca, which is um, some of the um, <laughs> some um, members of Mexico face. And they get together, and like three, four families, we um, get together to um, afford the house, at least a three-bedroom house. And this is all. Thank you. Gracias por escucharnos. Thanks. Thank you. Marie Mason, followed by Don Kowalski, and then Holly Huff. Good afternoon, members of the board. I'm Marie Mason. I'm the vice president of the Susanna Mills Homers Association, and I'm here representing our community. There are serious fire and water issues on the two properties staff has chosen for the high density housing in the Knolls. Staff has chosen these two properties and one other for the simple reason that the property owners are willing to be rezoned for high density housing. However, being willing to do so and being reasonably able to build these units are two very different matters. 
We have contacted the Simi Valley Water District to get clarification on how these properties can get water when the existing water tanks that serve the Knowles now meet only the minimum requirements of the Ventura County Fire Department for single-family residential properties. The properties on the Pass Road currently get their water from our water tank, so these would be separate. These properties would not be allowed to get any water supply from the Knowles tanks. Therefore, they would have to run their own water system from the point on Smith Road where the water is pumped to the Knowles tanks. They would have to have a full water system analysis report, engineer certification, and come up with some type of system to divert water to these properties. It's approximately a half a mile over or under the railroad tracks to get to these properties. It is not simply run some lines up the Santa Susana Pass Road and get water, as staff suggested to the Planning Commission. These properties not only have very costly water issues to address, there are many other issues that we think cannot be mitigated to less than significant, such as the safety issues with no sidewalks for children to walk to school, no bus service, no shopping areas, and the fact that the oak trees would have to be removed to create a clear line of sight for travel on the Santa Susana Pass Road. These trees are on a property next to this, these properties. If these trees are located in the right-of-way, that would not be a problem. But if these trees are on private property, this is also an issue that net cannot be mitigated. We don't believe this issue has been fully addressed. The Knowles is filled with problems of not knowing where our right-of-ways are. We have survey issues. We, half of us don't even know where our property lines really do exist, nor does the county. This zoning, rezoning seems to be just an exercise on paper to send off to the state and will not meet short or long-term needs. We suggest that the county should not just put this on paper and wait 10 years and at that time have to revisit this issue. Just pick, up, just pick one or two of the larger sites since there are six other potential sites with a total of 514 potential units with just as many issues as the Knowles properties but not with willing property owners. Willing property owners should not be held, hold so much weight in deciding this issue that can potentially change a community forever. Having a willing property owner does not mean it will ever happen. And these Knowles properties have one thing that the other properties do not have. They are in a very high fire zone area. We have fires that come through every two, to three, five years, and they always come on this side of the road because that's the direction, that's where the open space all is. The county needs to look beyond today and come up with a plan that addresses not only current but future low-income housing needs. The county should not piecemeal this and should designate sites that are large enough to accommodate long-term needs and properties that might actually end up being built. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Lisa. Our next speaker is Don Kowalski, followed by Holly Huff, and then Karen Dowdy. Good afternoon. Um, I'm a Knowles resident, have been for a long time, and find that a willing seller is a strange thing to base um, a, a development such as this, such an incongruous development with our community. You know, we. Um, we live in, a, as you know, a fire area, and as Supervisor Foy so rightly said, on a road, it's on a road that is very perilous. Not only do you have cars coming down at the rate of knots, you have bicycles coming down at the rate of knots. And it's kind of a training road for bicycles, and the only connection from the San Fernando Valley, or one of the only connections. In, in, when there's um, a problem on the freeway, this is the only road into Simi Valley that is used. So um, it becomes a very well-traveled road. The thing is, if once you've got these houses built, if you ever do, because this willing seller probably is totally unaware of what kind of funds he's going to have to put out to bring the water to this project in order to build in the first place. So if he does manage to do this um, and does get it then built, you've got to get these children to school. The nearest elementary school is a mile away. It's half a mile with no pavements, so the children are going to have to walk on a dirt shoulder on a dangerous road, cross it to get to the elementary school. To get to the high school, it's two miles, and to get to the, the junior high, it's four miles. And there's no bus service. Now, there's a public bus, but that's 1.7 miles away on Los Angeles Avenue, which services Simi Valley. 
and the nearest stores are one and a half miles away, 1.7 miles away, and drugstore. So anybody who's left in that development without a car and with young children is going to push a stroller without any sidewalks and have to go at least almost two miles to the grocery store and two miles back in heat, in rain, in Santa Ana winds. So um, I think it's absolutely ridiculous to put high, high, um, you know, high density in an area where you are two miles away from any decent facility or any facility where you can buy, a, you know, your groceries and get your children to school. Because if you're a very low-income person, the chances are if you've got a partner who's working and if they're driving to work, you're going to be without the car. Now, if there's a fire, which we get at least every two years, and mandatory 911 evacuations, those people are going to have to walk out with their children, with no, you know, along with the fire traffic, along with the, or the emergency traffic, and along with the, with the craziness of evacuating communities. We're a community of almost 500 houses, and this would be a tenth more of our population being put into this community. So it's a very considerable amount of population to be adding to a small rural community. And the police, we, we are serviced by Ventura County, and many times, because I've worked with Neighborhood Watch in our community, the sheriffs have told us that then when they get a call in, they have to come from Santa Rosa Valley. So Santa Rosa Valley to the east end of Simi Valley is a long way for a response. Some people have, I remember a friend of mine who's horror, had, had a horror police. story and was being attacked, a father was being attacked with a hammer. It took 40 minutes for the sheriff to get there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kowalski. And then uh, Holly Huff, followed by Karen Doty. Doty, thank you. Couldn't read the handwriting. And Hi, you guys. Uh, I think Donna Marie said just about everything I wanted to say. I just wanted to emphasize the fire hazard area and that one of your health and safety was one of your most important reasons or considerations. And, and no one's have spoken about the railroad tracks that this property abuts right to. And from what I understand, they have to have a setback from the railroad track. So in reality, I don't know how far the setback is, but they wouldn't really have an acre. Um, and then they can close off their acre, but the whole rest of the railroad tracks is open. Um, so it's, it's being stuck between the pass road and the railroad tracks is not a safe place for children. And they'd have to cross the the pass road to get to a park, to, it's just a bad spot for kids in any, from walking to school would be nuts. Um, I didn't understand you only have three more years and then you're going to probably have to do this again. <clears throat> so I think it's kind of, I did send an email saying that some of the issues we've had in our community is that, that the county doesn't look at the big picture. And so I think you should be considering more properties to rezone besides just the R2 because we've got a guy that wants to, doesn't live there and wants to sell, it's for sale anyway. It's, it is a terrible reason to make a decision um, on something like that. And then I had a setback from the railroad tracks, which really doesn't give you an acre. And then it was said that next door was a church, across the street was a church, but really across the street is a home and behind that home are homes. It's a residential, very rural, low density residential community so um, and then and then I probably don't shouldn't even say this I don't have time for this um, besides you know the big picture but say that this the water issue is a bigger issue say if for some reason it was too costly or it didn't happen would the owner be able to rezone back to something he could do with his property if he couldn't put a development like this on it thank you thank you uh, Ms. Doty, followed by Julie Nelson. I'm sorry, Judy, Julie Wilson and Sonia Flores. You can, you can begin your testimony, and she'll hand it out. Oh, they need to be handed out so you can see. She needs to click when your time starts. So if you can start okay. talking, I'll she'll start click talking. it and then pass on out the, the fourth page that you'll receive here. 
is a list of the 25 business people in Montalvo who object to this idea of amending the zona. The next two lower pages uh, are your guide to the photographs. The top page, you can see, is the map. You sort of have to separate them for yourself. So here we go. First photograph. First photograph. You, you see A there is the motel, a proposed site. One is the pet emergency clinic. The owner there is very definitely against this. Uh, when I say amended zoning, I just mean, you know what I mean, for the emergency homeless, homeless shelter. Okay, uh, that's 36 feet between the two places. You'll see arrows to the left. Uh, it's a big business building housing Gold Coast Broadcasting, whose owner manager does not want the zoning amended. Proximity, zero feet. Picture two. Mike McBean, CEO of Central Courier, standing at the property where he does business. A, the motel, 4, Ace Auto Repair, X marks the property line. Proximity to A, zero feet. Next photograph, third, A is the motel and restaurant, 3 is Ace Auto Repair, photo was taken from 4. Property owned by Rosemary Carson, who wants to open an antique shop there. Proximity of 3 and A, 36 feet. Proximity of four and A, 98 feet. Okay, number five, five, two, five has three little pictures. They're all my property. The first one shows a, an oleander bush. Now, it looks like two, it's really one. A homeless person made his nest in there last autumn. He broke apart the oleander bush to make a nest, and then he lay on the oleander branches he'd broken off. What if this man had cut himself, had had plenty of this seepage into himself, and killed himself? I was very unhappy with this. This shows right up next to the house where a homeless shelter, where a homeless shelter person would have loved to have lived, apparently, because he was sleeping there one night. Now, this shows from the front of the house, from the property, actually, Alameda, back into where that arrow is. The person was sleeping under Molina's bedroom window. Now, next photograph, B is this strip center. Uh, Betsy calls it strip center. She's the owner. Seven is when alert you, committee. When you say next photograph, what number are you referring to? I don't really have numbers on them. Uh, okay. The next photograph shows a car and then a building to the left and a building to the right. With B is, among, uh, is the, the locator identifier for the building on the left, which is the strip center. Seven is alert communications, okay? Distance between the two parcels, zero feet. Alert communications is completely against it. B, uh, the next photograph, B is actually showing the strip center. So you heard about the pep groomer? Okay, she's right there on the right. She's the one who put $30,000 into fixing up her, her part, her part of the parcel there for her business. Uh, Betsy Weil has guaranteed her she can keep that business there for life, okay? Next photograph, you heard Thor with his little daughters. This is his gate on Grand, looking down toward the parcel that you just looked at, parcel B. Okay. Uh, this is the next one is the Montalvo School, looking down toward parcel B. Now the children, um, I'm forgetting to give you distances there. Uh, yeah, I'm trying. Okay, the elementary school, 1914 feet, under the 2000 Jessica's Law. 11th is Bristol. Okay, what you're looking at in Bristol is the, the, stop, the uh, bus stop with the liquor store right in back of it. Okay, now from there on, you'll have to read these things for yourself. But you've got distance from the lock the liquor store to each one of the sites. Distance. Would you mind if I had one more minute? Try to wrap up. Okay. I'm going to have to hand this to you, too. The distance from the bottom lane homeless where they come in on Stanley Avenue to Vons Market is 1.55 miles. Lin 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 excuse me, length of Bristol Road from Grand to Johnson, 0.55 miles. Distance from Site A, the motel, to the, your here, right here where you are, 1.1 miles. Excuse distance. me, ma'am. Yes. I'm going to interrupt you, which gives you more time. Okay, uh, thank you. Because I'm going to actually slow down. I just want to follow the last part of your testimony, and it's going quick enough. I'm not sure. So could you just start over? You know, you said, could I have one more minute? Yeah. I'd like to know what you want to tell us in this, that one minute. And so take your time. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I took in a homeless guy. I've taken him in three times. So the last time he was actually in living in the bottom line. That's how I found out where they come into the city. They come in from uh, the very end of Stanley Avenue. 
So from where I picked him up to bring him back to my home, uh, down to Vaughn's Market, which is where he would go to get his food and where he would go to use the telephone to call me, was 1.55 miles. Okay. Now, the length of, of Bristol to Grand, to, or from Grand, excuse me, to Johnson is 0.55 miles, a third of that. The distance from the motel restaurant to right here where we are at the main entrance out there, 1.1 mile. The distance from Site A, one more time, the motel, to Buena High School is 1.6 miles. Okay. They can all easily walk the length of Victoria, the whole length of commercial Victoria. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you very much. Now, here is a map if you want to see the map. I could not copy it because it's uh, copyrighted. So would you like to see the map? I think we're familiar we with the area. I appreciate I also bringing the, the photos. And yeah, it turns out in the last meeting, it seemed like the, yes. the people from the county really didn't know. So we decided to do it this way. So thank you for your that's attention. That's, that's our closest post minute. office. We all got to go to that one. Uh, Julie Wilson, followed by Sonia Flores. <laughs> Hello, thank you. My name is Julie Wilson. I represent Gigi's Cocktail Lounge at 2493 Grand Avenue in Montalvo. Um, I also represent the voice of our customers and residential neighbors and friends and property owners in the area who have all given me um, uh, the power to speak for them by way of signature. I have sent you all a letter here, and if anybody didn't get it, please let me know. I'll get it to you. I don't want to repeat anything in my letter. I wasn't even going to speak today because I spoke last time, and I wrote you all a letter. I figured I had everything I needed to say. Then I spoke to um, Mr. Steve Bennett's office this morning, and I learned something that it became a little more clear. I don't think everyone in Montalvo really understands, and, and what the gentleman said to me is, first of all, the state has mandated that there is um, that – Ventura County um, find properties to or, or locations to rezone to allow for homeless uh, I shelters just, to make it easy. I know you're trying to say this so that everybody really they mandated that we find a zone. A zone, yes. Not, not properties. I'm trying, I'm had, trying to had, word it correctly. We had to find a zone that we would say you could have these in. Okay. Right, and um, and that that doesn't mean it's ever going to happen. And we, I, I understand all that. Um, and then he went on further to say, actually, it's not even going to matter because in uh, Montalvo, in one year's time, it's going to be annexed into the city of Ventura. And at that point, um, the laws are going to be changed as far as zoning. So whatever zoning that was allowed by the county will not be zoned allowed by the city. So I said to him, well, so this is all a pointless exercise then? And he said, no, it's not really a pointless exercise because we are fulfilling a mandate by the state. But in reality, we're not fulfilling a mandate by the state if in one year's time that's all going to be dissipated anyway because of, you know, all these smoke and mirrors. And so I think that, you know, not only do we stand by our request to have our um, this completely removed from the proposal because of so many reasons why that have been listed before again and again, but because we aren't addressing the needs of the homeless people in this county. And the state has asked us to try to fulfill uh, this mandate so that we could solve a problem. So why not be proactive enough to find a location that is in real something that we could real in reality come to fruition and build something using the money that was set aside, the $3.1 million that was set aside to do so, then zone that area and make it last 100 years so that we solve our problems and, and be proactive instead of putting everyone in Montalvo through this who is concerned, who won't be able to sell their properties because of it and who the people who won't want to send their kids to school there and, and the businesses that will be, you know, lot losing, you know, income because of it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker then is Sonia Flores. Followed by our Ag Commissioner, and I would have put you up front if I had seen your card in here, Henry Gonzalez. Okay. Got to get him back to work. <laughs> Hello, my name is Sonia Flores. I'm coordinator of House Farm Workers of Ventura County, and I live in the, in the city of Fillmore. We are five years into this housing element planning period with only three years left within the planning period. 
We need the County of Ventura to move forward now with your commitments to allow exceptions to the minimum parcel size for Fallmarker housing complexes on land zoned AE that is within or adjacent to a city sphere of influence and the redesignation and rezoning of eight parcels to residential high density to provide opportunities for development of low income housing by right as required by Government Code Section 655.83.2. In 1998, Ventura County SOAR was passed, which protected open space and agricultural and rural land. However, in order to protect agriculture in Ventura County, we need to ensure that there's a stable farm worker workforce, that that workforce has access to clean, safe, and affordable housing. The creation of farm worker housing supports agriculture. You have an opportunity to ensure that this happens, and at the same time, you'll be meeting your state-mandated obligation to plan for lower income housing needs. If you have an adopted housing element, you should start right away on the subdivision of partials for the creation of farm worker housing on land zoned AE. You still don't have the ordinance in place that will allow any of the farm worker housing on the ag land to be built. In terms of your projection of how many farm worker housing units that are going to be built, it's ridiculously high, especially because you haven't done what you need to do, which is to pass the ordinance for the subdivision of partials in order to make that happen. The need for farm worker housing is so overriding and the likelihood of a real significant contribution to meeting that need is so minimal that creating more and more barriers and hoops for people to jump through in order to be able to produce the housing really has a significant impact on the county's ability to sustain the agricultural industry. I'm going to be referring later to two uh, letters that were submitted to you before, or two letters that were written. Um, but at first I'd like to talk about a conversation I had with a young woman named Yeni Maganya, who lives at Rancho Sespi in Peru. Her family lives there, but now she's actually attending uh, the University of California at Davis. She's majoring in American Studies, Culture, and Nature, with a minor in Community and Regional Development. She said the following, since moving from Fillmore to Rancho Sespi, my family has experienced great triumphs, such as, such as my brother completing his undergraduate career from the University of California, Berkeley, and then completing his master's in San Diego in school counseling. My eldest sister, who suffered from, from cerebral palsy as a month-old baby and is now in a wheelchair, continues to go to adult school, where she is now capable of communicating with us through a computer. Both my younger sisters are striving to continue their studies. One is studying to be a CNA, and the youngest hopes to be a veterinarian in the future. I truly believe that all of my siblings' goals and dreams have been a result of the positive environment that Rancho Sespi has had to offer. The second le uh, letter was emailed to you. It's by Luz Figueroa, and she says, uh, My father was a farm worker for over 20 years. He worked numerous jobs and was the sole provider of the household. An income such as his has never been enough, was never enough to pay for commodities, much less luxuries. After my father was accepted at Rancho Sespe Apartments, I was able to see everything change for the better. This change represented my family being able to place a little more income in nutritious foods, transportation for the family, health care services, and higher education for my siblings and me. A lot of people do not see these struggles many families like mine go through every day. The difference that affordable housing makes is incredible, and I know for certain that everyone benefits from it. She's a resident of Rancho Sespi, and uh, she's currently working in FoodShare as a CalFresh Outreach Assistant, which is a nonprofit organization that focuses on providing food assistance to families in all of Ventura County. And the last letter you have uh, before you, and that's a letter from Victor Espinosa, who's the chair of the Santa Paula Farm Worker Housing Committee, and they urge you also to move forward with uh, with the eight partials that we talked about, and they said, uh, I urge you to retain all of the eight partials identified as possible sites for rezoning to residential high density for the development of affordable housing. It is very difficult to cite these projects. The more sites that remain on the list, the better the chance of success. Thank you. We did receive the letters, and I note the one from Luz also talks about um, being the eighth child in a family of nine, having come from Jalisco, Mexico, ten years ago, and I guess now is studying at the university uh, at Northridge CSUN. Just a lot of obstacles there. Right. Health the stories. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Our next speaker then is our ag commissioner, Mr. Gonzalez, followed by Barbara um, Macri Ortiz, and then Theodore Davit Cornyn. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Parks, members of the board, Mr. Powers. My name is Henry Gonzalez. I am the Ventura County Agricultural Commissioner, although I'm not here as the Agricultural Commissioner. I'm here as a member of the Ventura County 
Farm Worker Housing Task Force. And thank you for the opportunity. I don't envy you in your decision. It's not an easy one. I'm not going to get into the specifics of the, uh, the proposal because it's very complex. Uh, but I, I do want to uh, encourage you to help create, to make a decision that helps to create or facilitate the creation of farm worker housing. In Ventura County, we have a very unique situation. We are so close to the megalopolis of Los Angeles, and yet we are the number eight ag-producing county in the state and the number nine ag-producing county in the nation out of 2,500 counties, more than 2,500. And our economy is about, our ag production is about $1.6 billion, more than 1.6. If you use a multiplier effect of a, a factor of three, that's closer to $4.8 billion that ag generates for Ventura County. It is remarkably healthy, the ag economy here, but it, it, is, it is built on the backs, if not by the farm workers here. And that's why I'm encouraging you to, uh, to do what you can for farm workers for farm worker housing. Most of agricultural workers are the least well paid, minimum wage or slightly above, coupled with the intermittent aspect of farm work and you can see where they don't have enough money to pay for their housing as well as other things that they need. You may or may not know that I was born into a migrant farm worker family and I was actually a farm worker myself, even in college. And I lived in farm labor camps, I lived in sheds, and even I lived under the trees in the orchard. I personally know what it's like for folks in this situation to try to find a decent place, a sanitary place for themselves and their family. It's not easy. That's principally my reasons for coming up here today and asking you to make the choices that have to be made, difficult choices I'm, I'm, I'm seeing by all the testimony here. And I want to encourage you that when, when projects do come up to you, specific projects, even though these are just zoning changes, but when specific projects do come up to you, I hope that you have the, the strength that it takes to make these very difficult decisions. Um, I can see that folks don't want these folks, these, this housing built in their, in their backyards. And wherever you put it, there's going to be people whose backyards it's going to affect, and they're going to be here. So wherever you build it, that's going to be the case. I don't see anybody coming and say, hey, come build it over here in my backyard. That is going to be the case. Wherever you build it, somebody's going to come here and not like it. You really need to, I believe, and I encourage you to make those difficult decisions and just make the decision to help the creation of farm worker housing. Thank you so much Thank for you, Mr. Time. Gonzalez. Uh, Barbara Macri Ortiz, followed by Theodore David Cornyn, and then Rosemary Carson. Good afternoon, Chairperson uh, Parks and members of the board. Uh, my name is Barbara Macri Ortiz. I'm here on behalf of House Farm Workers and also as a affordable housing advocate in the county for over 20 years. Um, I want to first acknowledge and thank the staff for enduring this process. It's been um, one of the most painful, I think, that we've experienced. Uh, hopefully, we're coming to an end. Um, I also want to say the most important thing that you can do today is pass the housing element, get it adopted, and begin to implement it, and to pass that zoning ordinance where we finally, after close to 10 years, are going to see the... Uh, amendment for the uh, farm worker parcels of smaller sizes so we can build some housing. And by the way, it's not growth inducing, it's accessory to ag. Uh, and so that's one thing I've, I've 
disagreed with the environmental because without the housing, you don't have the ag. So it, it, it's definitely an accessory use. Um, now going to what are you going to adopt in terms of the housing element. Um, I think it's very, very important to get a housing element that's in compliance with state law so that we can get some funding. Uh, because they're going to pull the plug. Uh, if there is any funding, we're not going to be able to compete with it unless we not only pass the housing element, but that it's in compliance. Now, I think I'll give you a, an analysis in terms of this whole discussion about sites. Land, and I've been doing this for 20 years, trying to find sites in this county for affordable housing in general and farm worker housing. And the best analysis is to say it's like finding a needle in the haystack. Okay? And in that haystack, they found eight sites. All right. Now, as an advocate helping developers try to get those sites to work, we are now at the point where we have to thread the needle. And I don't know, in terms, I know after a certain point in my life, my, it was much harder to thread the needle with your eyes. <laughs> and that's where we're at. This groundwater stuff, totally. Is it's that is a huge impediment uh, when you change the mitigation and and not recognizing you know that uh, the uh, water purveyor is paying the the fee the penalty that that's mitigation now it's not mitigation it's going to be very very hard to do anything and I think one of the people that was up here speaking about all the problems of the Santa Susana properties um, that just shows the problem. And in terms of a willing seller, there's a lot of definitions of willing sellers because if somebody says you want to sell your property and somebody's seeing a lot of dollar signs that they're going to make mega bucks on it, they're a willing seller, but then when they find out what it's worth for affordable housing, then maybe they're not so willing. So my advice to you and my plea to you in order that we can get a housing element that will be certified by the state is to put all eight sites in. The chances of developing any of those sites is not good. If I had a bet on it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put much money on it. Um, the bottom line is that you need to have opportunity. And the state, if you're just going to say, okay, we'll put for 50 units and we have this uh, 28 unit, I don't think it's going to get passed, uh, especially with all the impediments, because none of those sites are perfect. So I'd say throw them all in. And one thing, I know I'm past my time. I, when is. they started, they were like giving five minutes to people. And I just have this, to say something yes. about the emergency shelters. Okay. Because if you would try to be quick. just because I, I, have I will be quick. Okay. I will be quick. But the point is, I mean, you've heard some really dastardly testimony in terms of people. Um, what your task is by state law is to provide a zone. And if you can't do it in this zone, then I guess you do it in residential. Now, that would be fine with me. But there are consequences. And I think, you know, the choice that you made is for a zone. If you eliminate things from the zone, then you're really going to be looking at some discrimination issues. So I guess that's your choice. You want it where in the uh, commercial or do you want it in uh, residential? Um, thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Appreciate it. And next, Theodora, followed by Rosemary Carson and Eileen McCarthy. Greetings to our supervisors of the Ventura County Board. And thank you for listening thoughtfully to the housing needs of the most marginalized in our communities. My special focus is Ventura County farm workers. Most of us are not aware that the Ventura County itself ranks very high, although I'm so glad, I'm still very touched by what our Ag Commissioner had to say just now. His testimony brought me to tears. <clears throat> So I learned from him just now that Ventura County is ninth in the nation as far as agricultural counties are concerned, because I had thought it was tenth, so I'm corrected. Um, but in the entire nation, that's considerable. We have a very large population of people in our midst who are willing and able to do difficult 
dangerous and dirty work, very dirty work, in our local fields. Most growers prefer experienced workers, so it's to their benefit to help house their employees. Many of these folks have families with children. The local paper, the Ventura County Star today, has a wonderful story of a new installation of new playground equipment for Villa Cesar Chavez in Oxnard. I don't know if you saw it, but the children are already playing with it, which is really wonderful to see. Thanks to the efforts of the interfaith community, such as CLU, VC Ventura County Clergy and Laity United for Economic Justice, and many other supportive community groups, there already are a few excellent, quite a few excellent housing units for farm workers in our county. The imbalance comes from the fact that we have such large numbers of farm workers in the tens of thousands, and so few places which are in the dozens for them to live that are safe and affordable. The need for decent farm worker housing in Ventura County is extreme. So I ask our County Board of Supervisors to please keep these proportions in mind as you make your decisions. And as it says on this shopping tote from the National Farm Worker Ministry, did you eat today? Thank a farm worker. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Rosemary Carson, followed by Eileen McCarthy with the California Rural Legal Assistance. My name is Rosemary Carson, and I've lived in Ventura County for over 45 years. And a few years ago, I was looking for a piece of property that I could have as a guest house, as well as perhaps open an antique shop. So I, it took me about two years, and I finally found a, the perfect place. I wanted something that was very stable. I wanted a place that was very secure and safe and wonderful people, and I found that in Montalvo. Hardworking people that kept up their property, and I thought, this is the place that I want to have. Which, so then I bought it. And uh, I've used it for, as I say, for guests and that. And everything was going along fine until last year I was contacted by the, uh, the police department and said that your property has been broken into. And I said, oh, my goodness. And we went in, and here a lot of uh, my glass shelves and everything filled with antiques were broken and destroyed. A lot of things were stolen. And uh, so one detective says, I want to take a DNA test. Can I use some of the silverware that the person that broke in used? And I said, of course. And I thought, well, you know, with so many real serious crimes, a break-in and even the damage that was done to my property is, doesn't seem that important. But nevertheless, he says, yes, I want to take a DNA test. So about three weeks ago, I was called and told that they found the fellow. And he's in jail. On, uh, he's, uh, on, he tried to commit murder, and he's in our jail now. And I was very impressed with the detective work and uh, the hard work that uh, he did to find this person and get him off the street. But this is just one example that is happening to Montalvo and to the surrounding areas and coming up here. I've been told by Trader Joe's that they have uh, not homeless, they're, they're just people that just don't want to be a home. They don't want to have a home. A lot of these people are just panhandlers and people that are just hanging around to commit crimes. And we're seeing this. And when we talk about people and that, especially that wonderful elementary school, the children, when I bought the property years back, they were playing on in the front yards and this and that. You go by now, everybody's kind of inside they're not out there like they were and I it's a real tragedy and we don't want to make it worse so thank you very much thank you Miss Carson and then uh, uh, Eileen McCarthy followed by Paul Wilvent Wilford Bill Wilbert got it 
Uh, good evening, Chair Parks, Vice Chair Zaragoza, and members of the Board of Supervisors. My name is Eileen McCarthy. I'm a staff attorney with California Rural Legal Assistance, speaking today on, a, on behalf of a lower-income client of our office who's in need of affordable housing and who is a resident of the County of Ventura. CRLA submitted written comment electronically last night. Uh, you are currently being handed additional materials that relate to federal tax credits as well as a copy of the article that was referred to in uh, Sierra Lay's letter last night. The analysis of tax credit was prepared by Juliana Gallardo, who works for Cabrillo Economic Development Corporation and does an, an assessment uh, of the tax credit viability for each of the sites. I would first like to clarify the statement in Sierra Lay's letter with regard to the inclusion of all sites uh, to ensure compliance with state housing element law. The county was under an obligation to have revised its housing element by June 30th of 2008. It is nearly three years delinquent uh, and therefore in violation of state law for that amount of time. Given the delinquency of the housing element and the requirement that sites be identified to allow for the development of uh, housing, in this case lower income housing within the planning period, that is the reason that CRLA raised ser serious concerns about the Planning Commission recommendation as only sites 3, 4, and 8, and has advocated for the inclusion of a greater number of sites rather than a lesser number of sites in order to allow the possibility to, for there actually to be housing developed within the planning period. Uh, the tax credit analysis will show you the worst sites are 1 and 5, the next best are 3 and 4, next best are 8 and 2, with the very best sites being sites 6 and 7. So if any sites are to be left out, it would appear to be wise to leave out 1 and 5 and include all the rest. I want to just point out, um, with regard to health and safety issues uh, and guidelines for orderly development, um, the development of housing for lower income households actually uh, certainly would seem to be bettering the health and safety conditions uh, of lower income households. And also with regard to guidelines for order development, CRLA is actually commenting not only with the County of Ventura, but in jurisdictions of Oxnard, Fillmore, City of uh, Ventura, and we certainly welcome any assistance um, from the supervisors with regard to ensuring those cities' compliance with state law, which the City of Ventura and Oxnard are currently out of compliance. Um, as is uh, Santa Paula and Fillmore. Uh, I want to just finally say that um, there are fair housing implications. Uh, lower income households are disproportionately minority and disabled. The county's failure to adequately plan for the development of lower income housing has a disproportionate impact uh, on those households, uh, which is arguably a violation of state and federal fair housing law. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Certainly. Um, we approve the this, uh, many programs um, three years ago, and it was rejected by the um, California House HCD. Um, were you one of the parties that objected to the general plan at that time? Absolutely. We submitted it. Okay. Absolutely. It was not in compliance with state housing element law, okay. and arguably with federal and fair housing law. And do you think you may challenge this one also? I think that we're, depending on what decision gets made today, I think if the supervisors only uh, decided to include three, four, and eight uh, as sites for high density. That certainly that comment, would, our comment, would be forwarded to HCD as well as supplemental comment that would argue that the sites are not adequate for the development of lower income housing, and therefore it's not in compliance with state housing element law. So okay. I would certainly that, urge you. So that could put us back another few years. Right. So I would certainly urge we'll you to include all the get sites. This thing approved if we want to get these uh, measures uh, adopted. So right. I know we we all know that it has several good measures in it and, and the delay has already, you know, failed to provide that to low income. The opportunity is in front of you, Chair Parks, mm -hmm. to include sites so that your, your element would in fact be in compliance with state housing element law. Uh, no one more than Sierra Lay's client wants to see housing developed that the client could actually reside in. And I didn't even comment about the farm worker piece of this. We, of course, support um, the changes that were made uh, in 2009 with regard to the substandard parcels and look forward to that program being implemented as well. Um, staff has indicated that all the materials are in front of you to allow the board today to be more inclusive rather than less inclusive as to the number of sites to be rezoned to high density. And we would urge you, you to do that. And, and, and we have already approved a lot of that <laughs> once, so here we are again. Thank you. Yes. I just I was going to ask oh. uh, staff or, or maybe Eileen, the, um, to build the low and extremely low, 
Nine percent credits are, are required? It's not a question of it being required. It's a question, and that's why I, uh, it was just fortuitous that the article, which actually Chair Parks was quoted in the article mm -hmm. uh, in yesterday's Ventura County Star, as to the development in Thousand Oaks. And the executive director was ecstatic, that word wasn't used, but that nine percent tax credits had been awarded for that project. It, it's a layer of financing that makes the burden of housing particularly very low and extremely low income households so much less for the developer. I'm sure many mansions will be going after additional funds as well, to the extent redevelopment funds stay, going after those funds, going for state housing funds, additional federal funds, all of which would be contemplated by affordable housing developers for these sites. But it gives the opportunity for such an important layer of financing that it would just be tragic to not take that into account in, in identifying the sites. And certainly that would be the, the purpose of our additional comment to state HCD. Uh, Supervisor Long. But your um, comment earlier was that sites one in five, because of the criteria that's assessed for those tax credits, probably does not would not fall within that right. preferred. Correct. Mm -hmm. Which would be why, if, if any sites were to be eliminated from the eight, those would appear to be the appropriate sites to be eliminated. Um, and I did fail to mention that um, the Cabrillo staff person who provided the comment is actually present today with a comment card turned in, so can answer further questions as to federal tax credits. Thank you. And, and this is um, an excellent project, Many Mansions, being able to uh, move forward on this. It's on two acres of land, and it provides 60 units. Nice. You know, so it just gives you an idea if you can really focus your attention and, and, and move on a project. It takes a, a lot of cobbling together of different finance, financial sources, but uh, to me uh, it says a lot. You know, we're looking at, you know, many, many acres here, but what you can do on two acres, you can get 60, and we're just trying to get 28, which shouldn't, shouldn't be that hard, but, you know, we need to get that pinpoint accuracy and, and work towards it. So thank you for your work on this. And I appreciate your noting the high density of that project, <laughs> because I think that's part of the critical factors in terms of creating affordable housing, and I wouldn't even call it high necessarily relatively, but it's the appropriate default density for the city of Thousand Oaks. So. Well, and, and this state is requiring us to do 20 units per acre. That's, that, that's the mm -hmm. county of Ventura. Ventura's default density. density is 20 dwelling units per acre. And we don't have that zone yet, so. <laughs> we look forward to your approving that zone today. Thank our, you. Paul Wilbert, followed by our last speaker, uh, Juliana Gallardo. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Paul Wilbert. I live on Strickland Drive. I operated the Strickland Mutual Water Company for 35 years. I am a licensed water distributor. Uh, in regards to water on the 10 acre parcel, they have no potable water that to be provided. It would have to be provided by Strickland. And uh, I think I can speak for the majority of the people there. They do not want it. Uh, that fact is in my backyard. Uh, we have livestock. Back there, we've got, uh, so they'd have a nice aroma of Corral 5. Uh, as for the uh, homeless shelter on the corner of Joan and Central, uh, there is a test well uh, monitored by uh, uh, can't think of Santa Paula uh, water over there. Uh, at the end of Joan Way, there's a, a school, a Lima, Linda Vista Junior Academy. Uh, they did not receive a card, but the parcel which butts up to them, which they meet right in the middle of Perry Way, got one. Uh, we do not have the fire flow to handle it. Uh, there's no sidewalks out there. The closest store other than a liquor store is two miles. Uh, transportation, public transportation is a half mile down to Juvenile Center. Um, if you've ever been on, strict, on uh, Central during uh, high traffic, especially when the high school is in there, I can't get out of Strickland because there's no block to separate 
cars coming out. Uh, Mr. Villagosa finally got Strickland uh, graded somewhat, but we still flood because we have problems with people uh, intruding into the right of way. Uh, there's still a lot of problems out there. Uh, it's just not a, a feasible place to put it. Uh, and I don't think Strickland Water wants to provide the water, nor the fire protection would be in the millions of dollars to get fire protection. That's all I have to say. Thanks. And Madam Chair, I don't Any think, yes. questions? I don't think Strickland is recommended in there. But one of the things that we did do, you know, for information is make the left, left turn uh, pocket into uh, Rio Mesa to relieve the traffic there. Yeah, well, they, the they, turn, they put a turn lane there, but still, if I come up to Strickland. To relieve it, and it didn't completely yeah. solve it. But that. there's, uh, down in front of Burson Way, there's mm -hmm. keep clear, Strickland Drive, there's no keep clear. Mm -hmm. And you can't go either way in the morning. And, uh, We'll, we'll continue working on it. <laughs> I hope so. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. And our last speaker is Juliana Gallardo. Good afternoon. Um, my name is um, Juliana Gallardo, and I'm an assistant project manager with um, Cabrillo Economic Development Corporation. And um, as Eileen McCarthy mentioned, uh, we uh, did a preliminary analysis of the eight um, subject sites up for rezoning to see if they would be viable as 9% tax credit deals. And um, when we look at new sites to see if they would be viable for 9 per sex tax credits, we look at the proximity of basic amenities um, to the subject site to see if they're relatively close to um, grocery stores, schools, uh, open space, transportation, uh, medical facilities, and such. Um, as you can see, the report in front of you. So um, we performed this analysis and to see if um, the sites would be um, close to um, service amenities, and I'm just here to answer any questions that you may have regarding um, this preliminary analysis that we performed. Are there any questions? Thank you, and it is helpful to have that criteria broken out for us. I appreciate you doing that work. Uh, we have uh, Myra Amu Amazuka, no, Amez. I, I, I'm dying to know how to pronounce your last name. You were the uh, interpreter. Myra Amesqua? Mm -hmm. Yes? Amesqua. Right. Sorry, I was not assigned to uh, have, give my testimony. But, like, uh, hearing back there, um, I also have a story to um, show or tell. Um, I lived 10 years with my mom and dad. We were, we're six, actually and one single room where um, a bunk bed, like a double, a bunk bed could fit. And hearing um, how, I'm hearing the, the way that homeless is seen as one single person, but a homeless could be also a family with kids. At one point, my family and I felt homeless. We, one of the conditions of living in one room is that the owner could do anything they want with that room. So it happened to accidents that the owner told us like two weeks or 30 days, um, oh, we have to um, give the room away because we need it. So at that point, my family had felt homeless. And it wasn't for Cabrillo Economic Development Corporation, which um, now, I, a year now, I live with Cabrillo. Like, thank you to that, as my dad works in agriculture, my mom as well. Like, we have a house, like, um, our family has become very successful at that point. Me, myself, I'm going to my fourth year and going to California State University of Northridge. My sister, who is the oldest, who is now 23, has actually graduated um, season with the Spanish major, with the Chicano Chicano Studies major, and actually got accepted um, going to her grad master's in Cal State Northridge. My younger sister, who she is 18, had just finished her year at Cal State Northridge as well. And my brother, who is 8, has also thought about going to Cal State Northridge. So um, 
housing developments and uh, for agricultures and for homeless um, families or um, humans who we are all humans and we do all deserve a second choice. I think like thinking about plants and creating homeless for ev home for everybody, it's a good point. Like if we want society to um succeed, to have um to have better communities, we should all get in one community. Like we should all think within everybody. Not just like I understand when they hear homeless, it's another picture. But when you when you could also um, go beyond the point of homeless, you could find a family where in the future they could become very successful and get back to the community as well. So thank, thank you. A lot to be proud of in your family. So um, at this point I had one individual that I had called who was not here at the time, Jim Hupp. Are you back in the room? And that will be our last speaker. My name is Jim Hupp. I live on Strickland Drive, and we do have problems out there in Strickland. First of all, we have water issues out there. I wanted to build a granny flat for my mother. Uh, they told me that it probably wouldn't be feasible because we didn't have the water to do it. But, and I can't believe that you guys want to put 190 units out there in a 10-acre land. That doesn't make any sense. Also, we have a police problem out there. When we call the police, it takes them anywhere, usually from 30 minutes to maybe an hour to get out there. The Rio Mesa High School, I, my understanding is they have a sheriff out there who is out there immediately. This doesn't happen on Strickland. Uh, also, we have a traffic problem. As Ms. Wilford said, when you first try to get out, uh, when that school is in there, you can't get out on Strickland. Sometimes it takes, I've waited 15, 20 minutes to try to get out there. You have kids walking up and down also. I mean, they're walking on the, on, the, on, the, on the street, and we don't have any sidewalks out there. And you're forcing them on that, on that busy Central Avenue. And the, that, that freeway, when you get off 101, comes right down Central. We do have a problem with that. I know that in the kids, they usually walk like two or three abreast. If they walk three abreast, you can't. It's hard. You have to get over in the other lane in order to, to kind of pass them. So that, that really needs to be addressed. Um, also, um, I know that I had a homeless guy that, that had uh, next door to me, he burned down a garage, which caught my avocado trees and stuff on fire. Thank heavens, nobody got hurt out there. And you also have a, um, you have a, a jail out there that uh, I thought would have been better put or better place on Todd Road out there uh, that we didn't want that, that that the city did. It seems like to me that El Rio, for some, you guys are focusing in on El Rio. It's like four of the eight sites uh, is is in El Rio. Um, I don't think this is you know that this is fair. I don't think this, that you guys are are um, looking at other properties. Maybe uh, I mean if you look at El Rio. We are a, um, where do I, how do I want to put it? We're not a very rich community. And um, basically that's um, all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And I'll note that we had three comment cards turn in, uh, also from Gloria Hupp and Julie Hupp, opposed to the Strickland uh, issue. And then Chris McDonald, regard, uh, also opposing the Santa Susana Pass uh, portion. And that concludes our public comment. Would you, is the, does the board want a, a quick break or you want to just continue forward? Let's continue forward. Madam okay. Chair, I, I just yes. wanted to share one quick thing, you know, that one of the things that hopefully we're doing in El Rio and it might help Nyland, but not quite. Remember, we have the Safe to School route grants that uh, Dave Flesh is applying for, so that's going to help over on, on Rose Avenue. And, and I just wanted to share that with uh, with Paul or Jim. Okay. Okay. At, at this time, uh, yes, Supervisor uh, Choi. Can I ask a question here, our staff? Yes, and if, if staff also would like to add anything from the hearing, if there's anything else that um, you need to uh, clarify or.
hasn't been mentioned yet. It's uh, under the new proposed rules and for and looking at some of the big farms that you know thousand acres, thousands of acres. Under the housing, what are we doing anything else that allows them to build more housing for farm workers on their property and in this at all? Um, primarily the just creation of the substandard size parcels allows um, additional farm worker complex construction in addition to what's already allowed. So everything else is staying the same? Right, everything else remains the same. We allow up to four farm worker dwellings by ministerial zone clearance right. if you meet the acreage requirements and you're farming the land. The same goes for um, animal caretakers as well. So there are other forms of housing that are allowed. Right. And when you say, and what is the size of that? Let's say they're just individual homes, four individual homes, 1,200, yes. 1,800 square feet for a farm worker. Correct. That's it. Supervisor Foy, yeah. if, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to just offer a, sure. another piece of information. The, I, can, I can't remember the exact year staff might remember, but around 2005, um, we convened a, a committee um, th that studied the whole issue of farm worker housing. Mm -hmm. And they came up with, a, with about 15 recommendations. And we adopted every one of them. And the only thing that, 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 if I remember right, every one or, or 14 or 15, but the only thing we have left and, and that I remember is this issue of the sub substandard lots that's now in front of us at this point in time. Supervisor Long, you remember it roughly like that? And staff, I mean, so we had this studied, and these, these were the ag interests. I mean, people in, in ag were, were the dominant people on this committee, and we did it. We did it all. So it met, it met their requirements. I'm just trying to think of, you know, we, right now we look at, say, Lee Monero out there. They've got a whole bunch of housing throughout their whole, their property. And uh, I'm thinking of some of the other large ranches where, but in that situation, we'd be limited to four housing units. Is that right? Or No, I was referring to the ministerial ones. Okay. They could apply for a plan development permit on any AE or OS zone land. Uh, for a farm worker housing complex. Okay. Same. Okay. So then we. Okay. That that's that was my key. I'm just trying to understand that we haven't changed or added any additional. Okay. So based on what Supervisor Bennett said, the only thing left to do is this substandard parcel piece. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's great. Good. Madam Chair. Yeah, which I was just thinking. I thought we approved that too, but I know we ended up getting back here. We we approved it to be part of this. Mm -hmm. We've been on this for so long that you yeah. you think we approved it, but this yes. this plan continues to to, uh, to languish out there. I guess. Yes, right? linger and languish. Uh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, it depends on your point of view, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of that. Um, it, 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 if I could, um, homelessness. Homeless families, homeless farm worker families, are in all of the communities of Ventura County. Every one of them, and I think ethical leadership, you know, requires us to make difficult decisions uh, to deal with this. And that's essentially what the rub is with every entity as they try to adopt their housing element. And that's what we have in front of us today: is we have staff that. I think consistently, we believe, has, has wrestled and fairly tried to respond to the mandates and constraints of state law, do something that makes common sense, uh, and, and, and be fair in terms of looking at this. In spite of staff's great efforts, we're always going to have challenges and we're never going to have the perfect options in front of us. I would like to have um, homeless, uh, these emergency shelters be in places where no one had any concerns about security at all. I, I just don't have the ability to make that happen and follow state law and, and, and do the other things out there. So. I think the Montalvo community is just a remarkable community, and we heard that today. I mean, I, I, I just fall in love with these communities where there are hardworking people that come together, 
there's not a lot of pretension, and they just want to to do well. They want to live safe. They want their children to be safe, etc. And the same thing is true in, on the avenue, and the same thing is true in Oakview, and the same thing is true in every community in, in, in all of our districts. So they raised real concerns today, uh, and I appreciate how they did it. They had. You know, they gave us factual information and testimony and the pictures and, and all of that. And they, and they, and they talked about, you know, who, who was there. Uh, and so I want to make sure that right now today as we're considering this proposal, we at least accurately uh, try to identify what, what, uh, what the constraints are and aren't, what we're proposing, what we're not proposing, et cetera. So we have that out there. So I have a have a few questions. One, the issue was raised. Uh, one 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 gentleman with who brought his, his his two two daughters here said he didn't think that number of 220 is accurate. Now that 220 represents what we believe to be homeless children in Ventura County. Is that correct, Carol? Who has been? Uh, Carol can come and, and I'm going to ask Carol to yeah. come and, and stay right there. I'm, I'm going to be asking you more questions also. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for the question. Um, Carol Shulkin with the Human Services Agency Homeless Services Program. The 220 number came from the annual survey that's a point in time count that's um, done each year in uh, communities across the nation. And so we literally, we being in this case, the Homeless and Housing Coalition that serves countywide, recruit a lot of volunteers. And so on one night, the last Thursday in January of each year, people go out and count people who are homeless wherever they can find them. And that would include uh, riverbeds, beaches, orchards, um, shelters, uh, wherever they might find a person. It does not include automobiles or vans. We're, we're directed not to approach people in cars. It does not include homeless people that we know are in motels night to night or doubled or tripled up. So actually, if anything, it's an undercount. So that's literally, factually, on one day in Ventura County, 220 children were living in a state of homelessness. And, yeah, yeah. and I could say that that very much um, goes along with the, my caseload um, in my team of, of social workers. We work throughout the county. Unfortunately, the number of homeless families has consistently gone up over the last three years. Um, so. Thank you. So that's 220 that we actually saw yes. and counted. Yes. Uh, they're, they're real out there. Yeah. Um, the um, a, a, Another question that was brought up, um, and, I, and I'm sorry she's not here. I should have asked the question while she was here. It was the resident from Montalvo that spoke with uh, Steve Offerman on my staff this morning and said, um, that he, you know the area is going to be annexed, so isn't isn't this you know why are we doing this? I, I, I want to make sure that that um, residents of Montalvo uh, understand this. And my question for staff is: Could we sit there and simply say, you know what, go with the other six places, but we just don't want you to go with the Montalvo sites. We just don't think that they're appropriate. Would we have the ability to do that right now? No, we would not. And the reason is, is we have to have objective criteria and apply it consistently. Okay. We cannot single out sites simply because they're right. in a given Thank account. you. And we're mandated to, to identify a zone. Correct. And it's not identify sites, it's identify a zone. We just, we're, when we identify the zone, for the benefit of the public, we're identifying the sites that meet the criteria that we, we came up with for the zone. So as much as... As, as we might say, you know, this one site in Montalvo feels, doesn't feel right. If it meets the criteria, unless we can find another zone, and, the, and for, you know, we, we, this is the zone that, that seems to have produced um, the most, most appropriate sites, I guess, from the Ventura County's unincorporated area. So that's the challenge. If you could, uh, you, you can't just say, and there's, so that I believe there's a real feel that, hey, somebody identified Montalvo. No, somebody identified a zone, that's commercial plan development zone, and then that zone resulted in these particular sites 
not because somebody went around and picked the sites, but they picked the zone. The industrial zone, like some cities have used the industrial zone, but they have they, their industrial zone includes where people live in the industrial zone, et cetera. Our industrial zone, we don't have that that kind of zoning in, in our industrial zone, for example, in, in terms of doing it. My question um, uh, for the CEO, um, eight potential sites out there as homeless sites. And um, if, and it, this is only if, what we have to do today is we have to demonstrate that there are some places zoned where property owners could move forward, ministerially move forward. And as we said, the two property owners in Montalvo have very strongly said they are not going to go forward with this. Um, but of the eight sites, if any of them go forward, uh, my question for the CEO is, is, will you ensure, particularly after you've sat through this testimony, will you ensure that the security issues are thoroughly addressed on any of these properties uh, before the ministerial approval goes forward? <clears throat> yes, uh, Supervisor Bennett, and as was presented in the presentation, that is the obligation of the, the CEO's office, and the, the testimony today was very, very telling and heartfelt, and that's something we will certainly take to heart, and, and we'll make sure that, that we follow through on that. Thank you. The um, Carol talked about the homeless count that is done nationwide, done here. Uh, I've, I've, I've been able to participate in that homeless count three of the last four years. Um, I also always go up to Ojai uh, when their winter warming shelter is open. I've never been to the winter warming shelter in Ojai, which, by the way, rotates around the community. But I've never been to the winter warming shelter where there weren't children there in the winter warming shelter. And I have to tell you, it, it grabs you by the throat when you see that happen. And, um, and, and I, I, I want to relate this experience to the board members and, and, and to the public. I have uh, teachers who taught at Nordoff High School, where I taught for 20 years, who one church was no longer going to be that place, and so there was a new place that they needed to go for one night. And these teachers called me and said they did not want the homeless shelter there for the very same reasons that we've heard today. Um, that is a concern about um, vagrants and, and, and people, et cetera. And I might point out, they recognize they already had those issues in their community. And we've heard that here. H homeless are in the Santa Clara River bottom. They're, they're on the Victoria Avenue corridor. They're, they're, they're everywhere. Um, and uh, we went forward with that site in, in Ojai, and they were very concerned about what was going to happen. But in reality, what happened was be, they ran the shelter so well in Ojai, they have such strict controls on the participants, and the participants want to be able to come, that the participants knew the fastest way to lose their ability to access the shelter was to cause any kind of problems in the neighborhood. And, and, and this, is, this is true, I can give you the names of the people who said, they called me six months after that happened and said they really felt bad about being in opposition because in fact their fears had not come, had not come forward. Now I believe for the people in Montalvo there are a number of things that are uh, make it unlikely that this is going to be an issue. One, the property owners don't want to do this. Two, in the relatively near future, the city of Ventura is very likely to annex. The minute the city of Ventura annexes, the county's zoning all ends, and, and it's, it's all now part of the city of, of, of Ventura. Um, it would be very unlikely that those properties would turn over to some other property owner who then turned around and, and wanted to do that. But if that did happen, uh, I, I really believe that our CEO would make sure that there really are the safeguards in place because there's, there, there is nothing that, that I think hurts our responsibility and our ability to make the decisions that are the appropriate decisions for, the, for, for people in trouble in our society than to not run a homeless shelter properly, to not run the Ojai 
winter warming shelter property. Those things erode our ability to get that done. And, uh, and I think you're going to find people doubling and tripling their efforts to make sure that it doesn't attract and cause, cause more of a problem. So um, we have, like I said, ethical leadership requires us to make difficult decisions and uh, we are way behind. We're three years behind in, in, in terms of doing this. Um, uh, this is not the perfect housing element. We will never have the perfect housing element, but it is the best that, that I think we can do, and I'm certainly um, going to be supportive of, of staff's recommendation uh, for us to move forward. I think the testimony that we heard about farm worker housing and the young lady who was the last one to speak to then be here for farm worker housing and then also speak on homelessness as heartfelt as you did was... was uh, was very helpful for us, I, I think. So thank you, thank you very much for that. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and Supervisor Long. Um, I have a question of staff, um, and it's for the public's information, and both the public here speaking, but also anyone who may be tracking this. Um, <clears throat> the housing element um, has a uh, history of, of perhaps not having, um, and cities. Uh, cities basically ignoring and saying, oh, there's no sanctions, there's no punishment or rules, and but things have changed. And I think things have changed because there's such pressure in the state of California to make sure that we have the diversity of housing to accommodate the, the, the needs for all income levels and, and all um, conditions of, of the people who live in this state. So can you touch just a minute on what those sanctions are if we if we continue to drag this housing element out in addition to being sued, but um, there truly are sanctions if you don't have a housing element. Well, first of all, the as was mentioned in the board letter, there are a number of state um, and pass-through federal funds that we would not be eligible in this county or even nonprofit organizations in this county would not be viable for in terms of uh, applying for or even uh, qualifying. So that's one disincentive. The other is that any aggrieved party could bring suit against the county if it feels that it does the county of Ventura does not have a housing element that comports with the requirements of state law. Um, the opinions of housing and community de uh, development, the state of California, are not presumptive of either necessarily being um, uh, fully in compliance or not, but it has great weight to um, uh, a, a court of law, and, it, and the uh, judge would take judicial notice of their opinions in weighing the decision. So. And if it was found by in a court of law that the county did not have an element in compliance, the court would direct us to change the ordinance or change the uh, housing element to comply. And there are the possibility of sanctions, including up to uh, denial of building permits for commercial industrial type projects. So those are the consequences of not having a housing element in compliance with state law. And, and those are, um, I mean, they're serious consequences in the sense of not being able to get those other dollars that help us to to bring in a project like many mansions and, and some of the others that we've been able to do um, and incentivize the farm worker housing. I truly appreciate our farm worker advocates for constantly um, uh, working in the cities um, to impress upon the leadership and, and to get some um, um, movement forward, but also our county responsibility to do the same. I, I support the staff recommendation. I, I, I um, would say that I, uh, I, I would support um, keeping in um, uh, both two, three, four, six, seven, eight. Uh, with the comments made by CRLA as to tax incentive, we know that that what we need is not going to be put on the ground by your your average developer in the sense of you know for the for profit um, uh, model. 
They're really put in by Cabrillo and others who uh, look to piece together those many levels of financing that are very creative and, and thankfully successful. Um, or we wouldn't have made the progress we've made already. So um, to move this, to move with the recommendation um, to exclude um, site one and five would be my leanings at this point for discussion. Supervisor Gosset, do you want to comment? I think I support uh, what uh, Supervisor Long was, was sharing. I think it's important that uh, that we all understand that, that affordable housing is needed across the county, not just uh, being from the 5th District. I know that most of the affordable housing is in the 5th District, and, and most of the, the workers um, live in, in Oxnard that go all the way across uh, the county to, to work in, uh, in restaurants and, and farms and so forth. So I believe that we need to provide that affordable housing, especially for farm worker housing. And I really was touched by the young lady that talked about, you know, the uh, family being homeless, living in a, out in the, uh, in the street, and, and the children, the 200 some children that they were talked about. And I believe there's more children because, as it was mentioned by, by um, our homeless uh, individual uh, or agent, that there's more. There's more. We didn't count the kids in the cars and, and the kids are in, in hotels and, and so forth. But I think there's more than the 220 plus children, and that's uh, I, I, to me that's a, that's not not correct. And also the uh, in El Rio, the uh, housing element and the uh, and the general plan housing was taken to the MAC. You know, and the MAC uh, heard it there at the, in the El Rio area, and. Uh, and I believe, of course, that I would like to have all sites, all the eight sites, but, you know, it's, uh, I think that um, if this is going to be looked at again in a couple of years, maybe we can look all the way across the county and look at other sites that, uh, that can help us with the, uh, our housing element. But, uh, and the water supply issue, too, I think that ultimately at one point or another we can probably get enough water to, to uh, accommodate those, those sites. So I do support the the, the uh, staff's recommendation at this time. Um, I would echo, uh, I appreciate uh, Supervisor Foy's comments regarding the difficulty of building in uh, the knolls, the high fire hazard area, the major roadway it would be on and sandwiched between a railroad track, the roadway, and no public sidewalks, no amenities. Um, being a planner, first and foremost, I just say this is completely incompatible, but it actually, I think, is dangerous to be uh, the idea of situating families with children in this location. So I, I have concerns about including, um, I guess it's three and four in the proposal, but I do appreciate uh, Supervisor Long's suggestion of putting two back in. I think that has merit. I think there's a lot of criteria that we look at when we're um, doing something as important as establishing a new zone in the county and one that has uh, some potentially great impacts if you don't locate it correctly, that a high density zone needs to be looked at very carefully. And even more so because this is it. What we approve here in, the, in terms of those zones won't have an opportunity to come up for a public hearing, won't have an environmental document like a CEQA document applied to it. So it is really important that we are very careful on citing such a uh, uh, a major z new zone in our county. And uh, in looking at the different criteria, we've talked about things like tax credit, you know, it, will there be financing? Is it a willing buyer? Uh, but then to me, is it compatible? Because people are going to be living there, and that's to, to me a really important issue. And then even more important than that, is it, is it safe? Is it, are we doing our duty by providing a location that is going to protect the public's health and safety and welfare. And that, that is our primary job. And I do think those two sites in the Knowles, in the Santa Susana Pass Road, I, I just don't think that they are, are safe because of the information we've been provided. In addition to the issues of the infrastructure, it is true also, it is a high fire hazard area and you also have limited uh, evacuation routes. So that gives me even more concern. So. 
when we're locating, we have to we have to be very cognizant of the people who will be living in the new location. Uh, so, uh, with that, I, I would support the recommendation uh, that Supervisor Long suggested, but I would take out the two sites in Santa Susana Knowles. And then, overall, it just um, it su surprises me that what we're looking at by state law is we need 28 units. And to me, 28 units uh, can be accomplished without uh, all this kind of what I consider a scattershot approach. I'd like to see us pinpoint accuracy, look at it, commit ourselves, and try to get it through, try to help with uh, financing, you know, put our, our county staff to work on it, then just putting out a, a lot of different areas, particularly uh, ones that I, I have concerns with the safety of people who the future residents of the location we're at a time when the economy is bad and people really need housing we're also at a time when we have a glut of, um, of un people who haven't of, of empty homes people who have ended up in foreclosure and we've got some creative things that we have done in terms of trying to uh, turn some of those homes over to people in need and there are groups out there doing that I look at many mansions who has actually taken apartment buildings and make them into permanent residence very creative thinking I look at the mobile home parks that are closing down right and left and how these people need homes or need a place for their mobile home. So I think it, it is really important for us to be creative, to look at um, places where we can have uh, affordable housing. I think there's more out there. This isn't going to be the end of our, our look, I think, here at the board. But I think at this point, we have really come down to looking at just a few sites that we feel um, that can work. And um, I, I would support a motion that does remove the, the knolls and and goes forward with the others that are there. And quite frankly, it meets the state law. So um, I, I, I know that not only uh, is the board and the county frustrated, I know housing advocates are frustrated that we have had this delay because if we could have gotten it approved originally, there are a lot of measures in there that could have already been implemented and, and I think would have brought some help also at a time when the economy was a little bit better. So that's kind of water under the bridge. It's just a, it is a point of frustration, but we have to commit ourselves and we need to move forward and hopefully do that without any more challenges so we can actually get this show on the road. So that's my position. And Supervisor Foy? Yeah, I, I appreciate uh, your comments on that too because I, th I do think it's just those two sites are very difficult. Um, and I also... It looks like we only need 28. Is that right? 28 to meet our goal? Housing units? For this year, that is. For this year. And then, um, and it sounds like we're, we've got a, we've got a lot more than that on some of these other sites, but I, I just don't want us to, to put something out there that I think our first number one thing we have to do is public safety, and that is just a dangerous road. Uh, Supervisor Parks described with fire, and even the comments uh, by the local residents talk about that. That site. I went up there personally and just sat there and looked at that site and just the cars coming by and, and, and you know, and if we're going to say that, we're going to say that it's, we're going to put people there with that train that goes by there and everything else. It's very, it's just not a site that I can see as something that's, that's viable. Um, we've had nothing but water issues there. We've been dealing with the water tanks, the water pressure. It's, uh, our fire department has made big efforts and I know the, uh, City of Simi Valley with the water district that they control has done a lot to try to just mitigate what's already there for those people. So it's it's a difficult place, uh, and I, everybody's made the right comments. This is a difficult thing to do. Uh, we don't we don't have a lot of opportunity. I don't like the idea of what's going on in you know the residential areas um, for some of the shelters because it does affect people's. But it sounds like according to what you're telling us, maybe the city's going to pick that up and that's all going to go away and. At the end of the day, though, the, the staff has done an awful lot of work to try to find some solutions, and it's a tough thing that they've had to deal with. Um, we've been at this for years, but I would go along with uh, Supervisor Park's recommendation to remove those two and and uh, do what the staff has otherwise said. So, thank you. S Supervisor Long, you, you, you were making a recommendation for, for essentially six of the eight sites, so is that... Is that your motion? Well, it was for discussion, and, and I can appreciate um, what the two supervisors are saying. 
I think we, as we heard from comments and discussion of staff, all eight of these sites have challenges. And some are probably insurmountable. But what we have, what we were challenged to do with the housing element was to identify as many as we could and to do so with all of the tests required under the legal documents that staff has processed. The SEIR perhaps differs a little bit with the comments made. But at the end of the day, to get bricks and mortar on the ground, whoever may step forward into any of these sites will do so, knowing what those challenges are and the cost are and whether or not even the tax credits are applicable. And I guess my suggestion is to move forward with the list that I provided, minus one in five, with the interest of getting approval for the entire package that has many other great benefits and programs and policies so that we can get those adopted and approved in the housing element and move ahead with those other policies and programs that I think have even greater value to us. So I will put forward a motion and see if it sticks, and that is to move ahead to accept two, what is it, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, removing one in five from the list. It's a motion. We have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Yes. It's not showing up here on our screen. And I would just, I'd ask for a consideration again of removing three and four because, first of all, neither of them alone can meet your 28 units. They could only allow 21 at most. And the idea that you're going to get financing for something that really isn't a big enough project for a bank to be able to move forward on, to me, makes it less likely. But most importantly, you're putting, you know, you're putting families and children in a place where there are no sidewalks on a major road. And to me, that is for the children. I just, I can't approve that. It's a public safety issue. I would ask that we have an amendment to the motion to exclude three and four. Okay, so we have a second on the amendment. And how are you doing, clerk? Because we, if you're having trouble, we can go ahead and just do it by voice vote. Okay, so the motion on the floor would be the amendment. First. And so if we could please vote on the amendment to remove the Santa Susana Knolls from this. Can you fix my thing? All of ours. Okay, so the motion, I've done the motion, Supervisor Foy, if you want to second it. Do you want to second it? Yeah, I'll second it. Okay, and it shows, and then if we could please vote on the amendment to the motion. There we go. Hopefully. Wait, did you see the new motion? Excuse me? Did you see the new motion? It recorded, so go ahead. We can see it, but we can't vote on it. There it is. And now what is the vote, clerk? The motion fails three to two, and then the main motion then is to have all the staff recommendations, but specific to the one and five, not to the high density zoning. It will be on sites two, three, four, six, seven, and eight. Thank you. Yes. And as well as all the other recommendations? Yes. Okay. Motion by Supervisor Long, second by Supervisor Zaragoza. If we could all please vote.
And that motion passes uh, correctly. Uh, three to two. Correct. Yes. Mm-hmm. And that concludes our hearing. Yep. For, for clarification. <laughs> and we have a clear part. Yes, I need a clarification. I, I want to be sure that we are looking at the recommended actions. So your your board had recommended actions one through sixteen, and that I just want to make sure on recommended action three, five, six, and nine, and four. I'm sorry, where it says that we're talking about planning staff's recommended action as further modified by the planning commission's recommendations. We're simply now talking about as modified by the board. Right. Yes. And it's not based on the planning commission's recommendation. I think they didn't have Piru, for example. Right. So we'll replace all of those with the board's recommended action. Yes. Very good. Thank you. And uh, with that, I believe we stand adjourned, unless someone tells me differently. Okay. We're adjourned.